Want to speak real Italian from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at italianpod101.com. Immersion is often hailed as the most efficient and effective way to learn a foreign language. In many ways, it's true. With all the language learning methods out there, nothing else comes close to having to think and interact with your environment in the language you're learning. Unfortunately, though, most language learners wrongly assume that the only way to experience language immersion is to pack up and move to a foreign country. But not everyone can afford to spend a summer abroad just to learn a foreign language. Luckily, there are other ways to immerse yourself. These methods are less obvious, but they are effective. In this video, we'll take a look at five steps you can take for the ultimate language immersion experience at home. Number one, transform your digital world into your target language. Technology is an indispensable part of modern life. We interact with phones, computers, tablets, and other electronic devices throughout the day. Why not take these interactions and use them to practice your target language? Most devices give you the option of switching the language of the operating system. Switching your phone or laptop interface to your target language won't make you fluent, but it will help you engage with the language in a very practical way, multiple times every day. Another way to transform your digital life is to check which sites you use on a daily basis and use them in your target language also. A great example of this is switching your version of Google. Using Google in your target language will allow you to search for things in that language and you're more likely to get results in that language as well. So if you're looking for a popular band, a show, or food, something that's usually written in your target language, it will actually be easier to find information about it if you switch your version of Google. Of course, you can also change popular social networks like Facebook or Twitter. You can even go to news sites for your fill of global news. Do you like podcasts? Try listening to a couple popular podcasts in your target language. Number two, write out a speech or conversation in your target language. A surefire way to increase your ability in a foreign language is to write out a mock conversation or speech in that language. Pretend you have to give a speech on one of your favorite topics. It could be anything from sports, hobbies, or even your favorite movie genre. Now, take some time to write out your fictitious speech. Inevitably, you will hit some roadblocks. But when you get stuck, research the words or grammar points you don't know. This is a highly effective and practical way to increase your vocabulary, and it'll help you practice thinking in a different language. Writing a long, connected train of thoughts exposes the gaps and weaknesses in your language studying. Once you know what these are, you're free to practice them and use them to continue on with your speech. This is also a great way to learn new words in the context of your entire speech. Context is king when you're learning a language. Learning words in the context of other words and sentences helps you surmise what new words mean. It also helps you get comfortable with how these words are practically used. Not to mention, context helps you to remember and recall new information more easily. Number three, practice with native speakers. There are a lot of great learning resources out there for anyone learning a new language. However, nothing quite comes close to practicing the language with a real person. If you live in or around a large metropolitan area, there's a chance that there are some native speakers nearby. Check and see if your area has any local language exchanges or language speaking groups. You're likely to find a native speaker there. If you can't make a connection locally, you can search online. Just as there are language exchanges in the real world, there are also online ones, most of which are free. Number four, connect with other language learners. Native speakers aren't the only people who can aid you on your language learning journey. Practicing with other learners is also helpful. Don't worry if you practice with someone who has a higher or lower level in the language than you. If you're the more advanced learner, you can learn a lot by teaching someone else. As you help someone else understand difficult words or grammatical concepts, you'll find that you start to better understand them yourself. If your learning partner has a higher level, they can be the one to help you overcome the hurdles you encounter as a beginner. After all, what better way to learn than from someone who, as a language learner, has been in your shoes? Number five, reward yourself in your target language. At the end of a busy day, we all love a little relaxation and me time. One of the most enjoyable and effective ways to develop your language skills is to kick back and enjoy the language while doing leisure activities. Whether it's listening to music, watching a movie or TV show, reading a book, or even enjoying a good online video binge, 
Even spending just an extra 30 minutes a day doing something you love in your target language can yield some serious long-term results. If you're a beginner, start with more basic content. You might have to start out listening to simple songs or even watching children's shows. After a while, though, you'll be able to dive into the meatier stuff and more engaging stuff as your proficiency increases. Learning a foreign language doesn't mean you have to spend your days straining over grammar rules or textbooks. Any way that you can take your learning off the page and make it more enjoyable will help you learn faster. Immersion is a powerful way to learn a foreign language. And now, more than ever, the immersion experience isn't limited to just world travelers. With a little creativity and the right resources, you can experience the language without ever having to leave your hometown. Many of these resources can be found with our complete language learning program. Sign up for your free lifetime account by clicking on the link in the description. Get tons of resources to immerse yourself in your target language. And if you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share the video with anyone who's trying to learn a new language, and subscribe to our channel. We release new videos every week. I'll see you next time. Bye! Want to speak real Italian from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at italianpod101.com. Cosa? Thing. Cosa means thing, so you can use it to ask about something you don't really know the name of, like, che cosa è quello? What's that thing? But in Italian it's really useful because you can use it when you don't understand what someone said, like, cosa? What? Can you repeat it? That's the meaning of cosa. Also, you can use it to say in different situations, like, what are you going to do tonight? Cosa farai stasera? Or, cosa ti piace mangiare? What do you like to eat? Anno. Year. Anno means year, and you can use it to ask, how old are you? So, quanti anni hai? Uomo. Man. Who is that man? Chi è quell'uomo? That man is my father. Quell'uomo è mio padre. Giorno. Day. Giorno means day. And you can use it to know which day of the week are you in. Like, che giorno è oggi? Which day is it today? Lunedì? Monday? Or you can say, buongiorno. That means, good day or good morning. Volta. Time. Volta means time. Like, let me pay this time. Fai pagare me questa volta. Or, once upon a time, c'era una volta. Also, we have a way of using that, that it's... A bit scary, like, I remember my teacher saying to me, questa volta passi, ma la prossima. And this is not a good sign. Anyway, so it means this time is okay, but the next one, and they don't finish the phrase, that is the most scary thing. But be careful not to use volta, asking for what time is it, because that's a different word, and it will be che ore sono. Ciao. Hello. Ciao is the first word, and it's a really useful word because you can use that to your friends to say ciao, ciao, but not to people that you don't really know. Buongiorno. Good morning. Buongiorno, that means good morning, and you can use it with friends or even with people that you don't know. So, buongiorno, buongiorno. And people can even answer to you back, ciao, that it's okay, but use buongiorno with everyone and you will be safe. Buonanotte. Good night. Buonanotte. So, good night. You can use it, of course, in the night, but it's a word that we don't really use to people that we don't know. So, it's like ciao. If people say to you ciao to say bye, you can answer buonanotte, but just if you know that they're really going to bed. Otherwise, it's good evening. So, buonasera. Sono desire. I'm desire. Sono, that means I am. You can use it with your nationality. So, I'm Italian. Sono italiana. Or with your name. I am Desiree. Sono Desiree. Mi chiamo Desiree. My name is Desiree. Mi chiamo Desiree means my name is Desiree. And you can use that to introduce yourself to people that you may know that you don't know. It's okay because it's formal and informal at the same time. It's okay. Mi chiamo Desiree. Aiuto. Help. Aiuto. Help. This is a really helpful word because you can ask for help. For example, aiuto, sono chiuso dentro al bagno. Help, I'm locked inside the bathroom. You're not dying and you don't need help quickly. You just want to ask if people can help you. That would be aiutare. Puoi aiutarmi, per favore? Can you help me, please? Chiacchierare, chat. Chiacchierare, chat. 
the most common error mistake would be chiacchierare instead of chiacchierare. Cinque, five, cinque, five. In one hand, there are five fingers. Ci sono cinque dita in una mano. Uno, due, tre, quattro, cinque. Ghiaccio, ice. Ghiaccio, ice. Be careful because if you don't pronounce G as a hard sound like G, it would be giaccio, that it's a verb and means lie down. Vuoi del ghiaccio nel tuo drink? Do you want some ice in your drink? A word that you can hear a lot, especially in summer, is ghiacciolo. It's an ice stick. I eat them a lot because it's so hot and some ice, flavored ice, it's great. Già, already. Già, already. Già has two meanings. First one, already. Sono già le sette. It's, it's seven already. To express consent would be like, oggi fa proprio caldo. Today is really hot. Già. Yeah, really, indeed. Another example would be Hai già finito? Did you finish already? Essere, to be, to be or not to be one. Essere is just the plain form that we're gonna change for every person that we use. So in the case of me, I can say Io sono desire. That means I am desire, but the verb is still essere, to be. Avere, to have. Avere means to have, but be careful because in Italian it's not the same as in English. So, for example, to say I am 20 years old, you don't say essere, so you don't use to be, but you say I have 20 years old. Io ho 20 anni. Fare, to do. Basically, fare, it's a general verb. Like, you can use it with a lot of things. We have the specific verbs, but if you go with fare, it's safe. You can use it anytime. <laughs> fare a cake, fare a discussion, everything is fare. Dire, to say. About dire, there is a fun phrase that we use, or maybe our grandmas, anyway, and it goes like, tra il dire e il fare c'è di mezzo il mare. That means from saying to doing, there's the sea in between. So the meaning is, it's not so easy to go from saying to doing things. Potere. Can. Potere means can and it's really useful because you can use it to ask permission. So posso usare il bagno? Can I use the bathroom? Potere as a verb means can, but potere with the article before that it's il potere means the power. Puoi passarmi lo zucchero per favore? Means can you pass me the sugar please? Sugar because I like sweet things. Amare. Love. I would say Amo la mia famiglia, I love my family. You can also say, I love my boyfriend, amo il mio ragazzo, o la mia ragazza, or my girlfriend. Yeah, as in English, you can use love also referring to things. For example, amo la pizza, I love pizza. And yes, people won't think that you are dating a pizza. Bella, beautiful. Bella, beautiful. What a beautiful girl. Che bella ragazza. What a beautiful day. Che bella giornata, but be careful because bella, it's an adjective and refers to something feminine. Chiacchierare, chat. Chiacchierare means to chat, I love this verb. Chiacchierare in Italian is something that you use when you're talking about not really something important. For example, the weather, what you bought yesterday, what you're gonna do tomorrow. Felice, happy. Felice, happy. I'm really happy to be here. Sono veramente felice di essere qua. Grande. Awesome. It's the same as in English. It's an expression that you use to say something you're happy about. For example, if your friend says, Hey, I got a promotion. Hey, mi hanno dato una promozione. Awesome. Grande. Grande. Big. My hand is big. La mia mano è grande. The word is big. It's a big, big word. Il mondo è grande. Molto, molto grande. Piccolo, small. I have a small dog. Ho un piccolo cane. But it's not true. Do you have some animals? Dolce, sweet. Oh no, there's sweet now. Il gelato è molto dolce. Ice cream is really sweet. You can also use this adjective on people. You're a sweet person. Sei una persona dolce. Diverso, 
different. People should respect different ways of thinking. La gente dovrebbe rispettare i diversi modi di pensare. In Italian, when you are discussing and you just want to say, no, it's not like that, you can say, no, è diverso. No, it's different. Primo, first, I was the first in my class. Ero la prima nella mia classe. And that's why I didn't have friends. No, it's not true. <laughs> Want to speak real Italian from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at italianpod101.com. Anch'io sto bene. I'm fine too. Anch'io sto bene. I'm fine too. Mi sento male. I am feeling bad. Mi sento male. I'm feeling bad. So, mi sento male is definitely when you want to say that you're not right at all. Sto bene. I'm okay. Sto bene. I'm okay. Which is the contrary of saying sto male. Say sto bene. Sto alla grande. I am great. Or sto alla grande. I'm great. Grazie per avermelo chiesto. Thank you for asking. Grazie per avermelo chiesto. Thank you for asking. I mean, this is something quite nice to say all the time when someone asks you about how you are, you know, you say, I'm fine, thanks. And you, sto bene, or anch'io sto bene, grazie per avermelo chiesto, which is like, you know, thank you for asking. And then, of course, if you're not remembering how to say, uh, thank you for asking in Italian, which is like, grazie per avermelo chiesto, you can say just grazie, you just end the thing in a very nice way. Più, plus, più, plus. Quanto fa 17 più 63? What is 17 plus 63? Actually, I think it's 80, 90, I have no idea. 80, 90, meno, minus, meno, minus. 45 meno 25 fa 20. 45 minus 25 equals 20 per times per times is a multiplication 9 per 8 è uguale a 72 9 times 8 equals 72 we use per uh, as a multiplication so you can say 2 per 3 4 per 5 you know and you use the per as a word, basically, to identify the multiplication. Dividere. To divide. Dividere. To divide. 28 diviso 7 è uguale a 4. 28 divided by 7 equals 4. Quarto. Fourth. Quarto. Fourth. Quant'è un quarto di 20? What is one fourth of 20? Dolce, dessert, dolce, dessert. Non voglio esagerare mangiando anche il dolce. I don't want to overdo it by having a dessert too. You can also use dessert in Italian as well. Uh, uh, let's say if you would like to know uh, which kind of desserts they have in a restaurant, you can say Quali dolci avete? Which kind of desserts you have? Cuoco, chef, cuoco, chef. Il cuoco oggi si è superato. The chef outdid out himself today, which means that he made like a spectacular dinner or lunch or, you know, he, does, he did prepare an, expect, an amazing food, you know. And you can also use the word chef in Italian as well. Fast food, fast food, fast food, fast food. In Italia si preferisce lo slow food al fast food. In Italy, we, the, uh, we prefer, I can say, slow food to fast food. And that's actually very true. <laughs> Or you can also say, um, le persone in Italia non amano il fast food. Like, people in Italy don't love fast food, you know. Ristorante. Restaurant. Ristorante. Restaurant. Questo ristorante ha ricevuto molte stelle. This restaurant has been given many stars. So that means that if you go to, to eat something in that restaurant, you should like eat a proper food, like a very quality, high quality food. Delizioso. 
delicious, delizioso, delicious. Le lasagne alla bolognese erano deliziose. The lasagna alla bolognese was delicious. Hai torto. You're wrong. Hai torto. You are wrong. Actually, it's the opposite of hai ragione, you know, I mean, you just state, you, there is just a position, you know, you are in this position and you state that this person, according to what you think, this person is wrong. So you say, hai torto, you are wrong. Non penso sia così. I don't think so. Non penso sia così. I don't think so. Well, when you say non penso sia così, it's more or less like you're not sure about what the person is actually saying but you are not like in a way that you want to agree or disagree with the person you just don't think that the person is just saying um, it's, it's just saying something uh, that is true according to you, you know forse maybe forse maybe forse is like to say I think so, you know that might be yeah, might be no you know, it's like the middle position and a kind of neutral position Non sono d'accordo, no. I don't agree, no. Non sono d'accordo, no. I don't agree, no. Actually, it's like to say, I torto. I mean, it's like stating a position, you know, you're not agreeing with a person, you know, or the situation or what is happening or whatever you think that is not uh, right according to what you think. Sono d'accordo. I agree. Sono d'accordo. I agree. So, um, it's of course the opposite of saying non sono d'accordo. Uh, sono d'accordo means that you agree with what the person is actually saying. E questo, l'autobus giusto per l'aeroporto? Is this the right bus for the airport? E questo, l'autobus giusto per l'aeroporto? Is this the right bus for the airport? You can also say this with trains, with any kind of public transport really, you know? And also, è questo il treno giusto per l'aeroporto? La connessione Wi-Fi è gratuita? Is the Wi-Fi free? La connessione Wi-Fi è gratuita? Is the Wi-Fi free? Then you can check your maps, you know, watch for public transport yourself, you know. Uh, you can also say, avete Wi-Fi? Which is actually pretty much the same, they will understand what you're talking about. Ha qualche posto libero per stasera? Do you have any vacancies tonight? Ha qualche posto libero per stasera? Do you have any vacancies tonight? In this case, you are talking about hotel rooms or, uh, you know, any kind of um, place where you can spend the night, where you are abroad as, a, as an hotel or a B&B or an apartment, you know. And you can actually say, Avete qualche posto libero? Potrei spostarmi in una camera diversa? Could I move to a different room? Potrei spostarmi in una camera diversa? Could I move to a different room? So let's say you, you just find an auto, but they give you like a, a very small room and you need more things and you can just say, avete un'altra camera? You know, they will understand that you want to change your room basically. Ho prenotato. I have a reservation. Ho prenotato. I have a reservation. So basically when you say ho prenotato means that you have booked. Zio. Anco. Zio. Anco. Lo zio paterno è il fratello di tuo padre. A paternal uncle is the brother of your father. Nonno. Grandfather. Nonno. Grandfather. Nostro nonno vuole ancora guidare l'auto. Our grandfather still wants to drive the car. Suocero. Father-in-law. Suocero. Father in law. Suo suocero è molto gentile con tutti. A father in law is nice to everybody. Madre. Mother. Madre. Mother. Mia madre sta frequentando un corso di yoga. My mother is taking yoga lessons. Well, actually, my mom... She does take Tai Chi lessons, so... <laughs> Mia madre sta frequentando un corso di Tai Chi. Figlia. Daughter. Figlia. Daughter. Dovreste dire a vostra figlia che deve studiare di più. You should say to your daughter 
that she still study more. This is something that if you go, you know, if you got someone, I mean, a daughter or a son going to school, you know, it can happen that maybe professors, they come and they say uh, that your daughter or your son needs to study more. So in the case is a daughter, so you say, uh, sua figlia dovrebbe studiare di più. And the male version, like for a son, is suo figlio dovrebbe studiare di più. Finirò la serie Survival Phrases su italianpod101.com ascoltando due lezioni al giorno. I'll finish Survival Phrases series on italianpod101.com by listening two lessons a day. Finirò la serie Survival Phrases su italianpod101.com ascoltando due lezioni al giorno. In Italian you can also say um, guarderò due lezioni al giorno su italianpod101.com which means I'll watch two lessons a day on italianpod101.com Finirò di leggere un libro in italiano leggendo 10 pagine al giorno. I'll finish reading one Italian book by reading 10 pages a day. Finirò di leggere un libro in italiano leggendo 10 pagine al giorno. In this case as well you can say um, leggerò 10 pagine al giorno di un libro italiano which means I'll read 10 pages a day of an Italian book supererò il mio test di lingua italiana I'll pass my Italian test supererò il mio test di lingua italiana <laughs> and I hope you do really capirò completamente un film italiano guardandolo tutti i giorni. I'll fully understand one Italian movie by watching it every day. Capirò completamente un film italiano guardandolo tutti i giorni. Uh, you can also say uh, se guardo un film italiano tutti i giorni imparerò la lingua. If I watch an Italian movie every day, I will learn the language. Memorizzerò cinque canzoni italiane, which means I'll memorize five Italian songs. Memorizzerò cinque canzoni italiane. Memorizzerò cinque canzoni italiane. You can also say imparerò cinque canzoni italiane, which means I will learn. Imparo is to learn, imparare, to learn. Buongiorno. Buongiorno. Good morning. You can also say uh, salve. Salve. Uh, is a more generic word that you can use with um, at any really any uh, any time of the day uh, and it's quite generic so salve is something that is very polite and at the same time you can use it all the time during the day so when you meet someone let's say you say salve so uh, the person is going to say to you salve or buongiorno Ciao, hello, ciao is, well, I think um, everyone knows the word ciao, you know. Um, ciao is quite informal, so you don't say really ciao to older people or uh, the people that you don't know, that you don't know really. So um, you can use ciao with your friends. Uh, but also, let's say, if you're going to a restaurant or a shop and you want to say to the, uh, to the person which is working, um, grazie, ciao, thanks, goodbye, you know, it works, you know. 
because ciao, you can use ciao as uh, hello when you meet someone, but also as goodbye, you know, so it's another very generic word as salve. Non ci vediamo da tanto tempo. Non ci vediamo da tanto tempo. Long time no see. Non ci vediamo da tanto tempo. Non ci vediamo da tanto tempo. Which in English is long time no see. You can also say da quanto tempo non ci vediamo. So it's a very long time that we haven't seen each other. Come ti sei trovato? Come ti sei trovato? How have you been? Which is also, you can say, um, come è andata? Come è andata? Which is pretty much the same. You can use it, uh, let's say, your friend go, goes to, um, your Italian friend goes to uh, somewhere for vacation and you want to ask him uh, how the trip was and you, you can say, come è andata? Uh, which is, come ti sei trovato? How have you been? It's pretty much the same. Come va oggi? How is your day? Come va oggi? Oggi is today. Vuoi sposarmi? Vuoi sposarmi? Will you marry me? Vuoi sposarmi? Will you marry me? Vuoi sposarmi? Well, uh, vuoi sposarmi? is the most generic way that you can say, that you can actually ask uh, your uh, um, boyfriend or girlfriend uh, to marry him or her, you know. Uh, of course, usually yeah, it's the man that asks the lady, but nowadays you never know, you know. But you can also say, mi sposi, which is the same as saying, will you marry me? But instead of saying, vuoi sposarmi, you say, mi sposi, Vuoi farmi l'onore di diventare mia moglie? Will you do me the honor of becoming my wife? Vuoi farmi l'onore di diventare mia moglie? Vuoi farmi l'onore di diventare mia moglie? Will you do me the honor of becoming my wife? So, moglie is wife. And marito, marito is husband. So if you want to ask your husband, your, your future husband, your boyfriend to, uh, to marry you, then you have to say, vuoi farmi l'onore di diventare mio marito? Vuoi fare di me l'uomo più felice del mondo? Vuoi fare di me l'uomo più felice del mondo? Will you make me the happiest man alive? Vuoi fare di me l'uomo più felice del mondo? Will you make me the happiest man alive? Vuoi fare di me l'uomo più felice del mondo? If you are a girl, you say, a uh, woman, you say, vuoi fare di me la donna più felice del mondo? Tu sei quello che ho aspettato per tutta la vita. Tu sei quello che ho aspettato per tutta la vita. You are the one I've been waiting for my whole life. Tu sei quello che ho aspettato per tutta la vita. Tu sei quello che ho aspettato per tutta la vita. You are the one I've been waiting for my whole life. Voglio stare con te per sempre. Voglio stare con te per sempre. I want to be with you forever. Voglio stare con te per sempre. Voglio stare con te per sempre. I want to be with you forever. You can also say, voglio stare con te per tutta la vita. For all my life, for the rest of my life. Per tutto il resto della mia vita. Mi piacerebbe andare a. I'd like to go to. Uh, let's say that our case is uh, you're going to Milan. So in, English, in Italian you would say, mi piacerebbe andare a Milano. È questo il binario giusto per Milano? Is this the right platform for Milan? So, è questo il binario giusto per Milano? 
Milan, remember, is our case. But if you go to, to Florence, to Naples, so you can use it um, depending on where you're traveling. And the answer could be, uh, si, è questo, no, non è questo. Si, è questo, yes, it is. No, non è questo, no, it's not. So it could be actually simple, uh, or yes or no, and they might give you direction where you where you should 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 go, you know. So, but usually, yes, they say um, if you if you ask if uh, it's the right platform, uh, si è questo? No, non è questo. A che ora c'è l'ultimo treno? What time is the last train? A che ora c'è l'ultimo treno? Ultimo treno means last train. And imagine that the answer could be at 11.30 p.m. So uh, in Italian is alle 23 e 30. Dove cambio per Milano? Where do I change for Milan? Dove cambio per Milano? And the answer, let's say, could be you can change the third stop. And in Italian, third stop is terza fermata. So, può cambiare alla terza fermata. You can change at the third stop. Dov'è la stazione? Where is the station? Dov'è la stazione dei treni? Stazione dei treni? Train station. Uh, stazione dei bus? Bus station. So, dov'è la stazione del treno? Where is the train station? Dove è la stazione per il bus? Where is the bus station? Let's say the answer could be uh, turn left at the second crossroad past the square. In Italian uh, is prenda il secondo incrocio a sinistra dopo la piazza. So, sinistra is left, destra is right. Square is piazza. Anche se non fossi un angelo, io non ti cambierei perché sei bella, 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 bella come sei. Sei bella come ti vorrei. Even if you should not be an angel, I wouldn't change you because you are beautiful, beautiful, beautiful as you are. You are beautiful as I would want you. I'm speechless. <laughs> Gosh. The first song is from one very, very famous uh, Italian singer. Uh, it's from Rome and uh, uh, his name is Antonello Venditti. And uh, the title of the song is uh, What a Treasure You Are, What a Sweetheart You Are, uh, which in Italian means um, Che tesoro che sei. And the song is by Antonello Venditti. So... Anche se non fossi un angelo, io non ti cambierei, perché sei bella, 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 bella come sei, sei bella come ti vorrei. Turbini e tempeste io cavalcherò, volerò tra i fulmini per averti. I will ride on storms and tempest, I will fly among lightning and thunder to have you. And the second song is from an Italian uh, singer. She's very famous as well. She's from Tuscany. If I, um, uh, I think it's, uh, she's definitely from Tuscany. And her name is uh, Gianna Nannini. And the song is entitled uh, Wonderful Creature. Uh, in Italian is uh, Meravigliosa Creatura. So, turbini e tempeste io cavalcherò. Volerò tra i fulmini per averti. So means that you can actually, you're, you're, uh, you can uh, do whatever it takes uh, to get a loved one to you. So it's definitely a very romantic way to express your love to someone. Perché siamo due destini che si uniscono, stretti in un istante solo, che segnano un percorso profondissimo dentro di loro which means because we are two destinies combining in one tight instant, marking a very deep path inside of them. Um, this song is uh, by Tiro Mancino, which is a very famous band, and the song title is Two Destinies, Due Destini. 
Very, very nice song. Very, very nice band. C'era la notte e le sue stelle e sul tuo viso era la luna. Così ho capito che per sempre non avrei amato più nessuna. There was the night and its any stars and on your face was the moon. So I realized that I would not love nobody but you forever. And uh, this song is by a, a famous singer. It's called Cesare Cremonini. And the song is The Man Traveling Among the Stars. And in Italian is L'uomo che viaggia fra le stelle. Stelle in Italian is stars. Moon, moon is luna. E il vero amore può nascondersi, confondersi, ma non può perdersi mai. Sempre per sempre, dalla stessa parte, mi troverai. And real love may hide, blend, but may not get lost. You will find me on the same side, always and forever. Uh, the song is from another very famous singer, Francesco De Gregori. And the title is uh, Ever and Forever. Sempre e per sempre. So, ever in Italian is sempre e per sempre is forever. Non sono affari tuoi. Non sono affari tuoi. It's none of your business. Non sono affari tuoi. Non sono affari tuoi. It's none of your business. You can also say non ti riguarda. Non ti riguarda. Sta zitto, sta zitto, shut up, sta zitto, shut up. You can also say fa silenzio, lasciami in pace, lasciami in pace, leave me alone, lasciami in pace, lasciami in pace, leave me alone. You can also say lasciami stare. It's the same as saying, uh, lasciami in pace, lasciami stare. Stai scherzando? Stai scherzando? Are you kidding me? Stai scherzando? Stai scherzando? Are you kidding me? Non importa. Non importa. Whatever. Non importa. Whatever. You can also say, non mi interessa which is the same as saying non importa. Want to speak real Italian from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at italianpod101.com. Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, what's the difference between potere and riuscire? Riuscire and potere are two verbs we use very often in Italian. Sometimes their meanings overlap, but other times they mean completely different things. Potere is translated as to be able to or can. It indicates the capacity and or possibility to do a determinate action. For example, non devi cucinare, posso farlo io. You don't have to cook, I can do it. Potere is an irregular verb, but more importantly it's a modal verb. Modal verbs are used to give additional information about the main verb. As with other modal verbs, potere is almost always followed by an infinitive verb without a linking preposition. For example, posso andare alla festa? Can I go to the party? Sometimes we can use another verb, riuscire. In English, this can be translated in the same way as potere. However, riuscire has a slightly different meaning. Its meaning is somewhere between the English verbs to be able to and to succeed. Let's see some examples. Non riesco a dormire, c'è troppo rumore. I can't sleep, there is too much noise. Sono riuscito ad arrivare in tempo. I managed to arrive on time. Please also note that riuscire needs the preposition a in front of the infinitive. It's not always easy to grasp the difference between these two verbs. Look at these sentences. Ho 15 anni. Non posso guidare. I'm 15. I can't drive. It's the same as saying, 
I'm not allowed to drive. Sono troppo stanca, non riesco a guidare. I'm too tired, I can't drive. It's the same as saying, even if I tried, I couldn't. Here is another example that may help. We can translate I can't sleep at the office in two different ways in Italian. One is non posso dormire in ufficio. The other one non riesco a dormire in ufficio. The first one is the most likely as it means that I can't sleep because of the office rules. The second one instead means something like I can't manage sleeping at the office. The speaker can't sleep not because of the rules but because of the noise or another secondary reason. Sometimes it doesn't matter which verb you choose. For example, you could say non posso venire alla festa or non riesco a venire alla festa. Though their nuance is different, the meaning is the same. I can't go to the party. To recap, keep in mind that there are some situations where you can't use riuscire to express the same meaning. Situations like when you ask for permission, posso uscire? Can I go out? When you ask for someone's help, qualcuno può aiutarmi? Can anyone help me? When you make a suggestion, potresti provare? Could you try? Pretty interesting, right? If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below. A presto, see you soon! Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, what does it mean when people say that Italian is a Romance language? Well, in this case, romance probably isn't the kind of romance that you are thinking of, with hearts, roses and people falling in love. Romance actually refers to a family of languages. The romance family is originally from Western and Southern Europe. For example, you might have noticed that Spanish and French are very similar to Italian, especially when they compare to other languages. You are seeing the family resemblance they are all Romance languages, and their common ancestor is Latin. Latin is an ancient language, and it's no longer widely used as part of public life. Latin emerged on the Italian peninsula as early as the 8th century BC. After the collapse of the Roman Empire, some 12 centuries later, vernacular forms of the language were given new space to develop. During the early modern period, emerging nation-states standardized these forms and made them into the Romance languages we know today. These Romance languages later spread from Europe to Africa, the Americas and even as far as Southeast Asia and Oceania. Italian has actually stayed the closest to its Latin roots, especially in terms of vocabulary. Romance languages farther away from Italy aren't quite as close to Latin as Italian, but they share the same roots. That's why Romance languages are sometimes also called Neo-Latin languages. Pretty cool, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. A presto! See you soon! Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, do Italians only speak Italian or are there other languages commonly spoken in Italy? Italian is such a famous and beautiful language that many people only know about standard Italian. However, that's only half the story. Actually, many Italians are native bilinguals. Italian is the most widely spoken language in Italy, but there are lots of regional languages or dialects called dialetti. People don't really use dialects in official or formal settings. That's why Italian is the official language of Italy. It's necessary to have a common language everyone can understand and use together. For the most part, dialects are only spoken and used in casual situations. A few of the major dialects might sound familiar to you. The major ones are Napolitan, Sicilian, Sardinian, Venetian and Friulan. And there are a lot more. 
You probably won't be able to find a full list of dialetti online. There are two main reasons why. Dialects don't have a written literature, so few documents have been written about them. In fact, most children learn a dialetto at the same time they learn standard Italian. The difference is that Italian is what's used in schools, while dialects are used with family and friends. Some people consider dialects as the only language that can truly express one's innermost feelings. Unfortunately, many children today don't learn any dialetti at all. So, if you go to Italy and you overhear an unfamiliar phrase, it might not even be in Italian. It could be a phrase from one of the many Italian dialects. Isn't that interesting? If you have any more questions, leave them in the comments below. A presto! See you soon! Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, what are some examples of Italian loan words we use in everyday English? You may not know it, but you probably use some Italian every day. Did you know that bravo, dilemma and paparazzi are Italian words? English is full of Italian loan words. We use them in almost every aspect of our lives, especially in art, music, cuisine and architecture. The most obvious is probably cuisine. I'm sure you've seen silly people try to imitate Italian by saying spaghetti, cappuccino, espresso, mozzarella, maccheroni. Well, they are actually Italian words. You might have seen al dente or pasta fresca, which means fresh pasta, on English pasta packages. Those are two different ways to prepare pasta. Did you know that the words zucchini and broccoli are also from Italian? Music and art also have plenty of Italian loan words. Take finale, scenario, solo and concerto. Those are all commonly used in English. There are lots more on a technical level too, like forte, fortissimo, piano, pianissimo, motto, stanza. In arts and architecture, studio, villa, graffiti, veranda and ghetto, as well as apartment, from appartamento, are all Italian loan words. The list doesn't end here. Umbrella comes from the Italian ombrello, lottery comes from lotteria, and tombola is also an Italian game. Madonna, Monsignor and Padre are all loan words related to religion. Scherzo in Italian means joke and novel comes from the Italian novella. Sonnet comes from sonetto. Italian is everywhere. Be careful with some loan words though. The Italian word doesn't always mean the same thing in English. For example, manifesto in Italian means poster. English loan words don't always follow Italian grammar either. Zucchini and macaroni are spelled differently in Italian. English words like panini and salami are mistakenly used in the plural form. Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments and I'll try to answer them. A presto! See you soon! Hi everybody! Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, does Italian have any false friends words that look the same in English but mean something different? The answer is yes. The term false friends is the perfect name for these words. They are like people who look really familiar but are actually total strangers. We'll go through some of the most common ones so you can avoid miscommunications when you're speaking Italian. If your Italian partner is going to introduce you to his or her parenti, you'll be meeting their relatives, not just the parents. The word parents is genitori in Italian. Also, if you see the word sale in a supermarket, don't think you're getting a discount. Sale is actually the Italian word for salt. If someone describes you as educato or educata, they are usually not talking about your education. They are saying that you are polite. 
And if you work in a factory, don't say you work in a fattoria. That means you work for on a farm. If you are a librarian, don't work in a libreria because that's bookshop. So don't think that you can borrow books there for free. Make sure you don't offer to take pictures with your camera. That means room. You take pictures on your macchina fotografica. Pay attention to adverbs too. Attualmente means currently in Italian. The Italian for actually is in realtà. Definitely doesn't translate as definitivamente either. That means ultimately. Lastly, when you're talking about an event that's coming up later than expected, don't use eventualmente for eventually. Eventualmente means possibly. And, of course, there are many more. Got it? Keep the questions coming. If you have another question, leave it in the comments and I'll try to answer it. A presto! See you soon! Hi everybody! Marika here! Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is What are masculine and feminine nouns and how are they different? In Italian, all nouns have a gender. A noun can either be masculine or feminine. That applies to plural nouns too and to all the words that can modify nouns, such as articles and adjectives. Other Romance languages have similar system of masculine and feminine nouns. It's a trait that comes from Latin. The gender depends on the origin of the Latin word. English doesn't have masculine and feminine nouns though. So the easiest way for English speakers to tell a noun's gender is by looking at the last letter of the noun. If a noun ends with O in the singular and E in the plural, it's usually masculine. If a noun ends with A in the singular and E in the plural, it's usually feminine. For example, sedia, meaning chair, ends with an A, so it's feminine. La sedia, in the plural, le sedie. Libro, meaning book, ends with an O, so it's masculine. Il libro, and in the plural, i libri, ending with an I. The OI for masculine and AE for feminine rule doesn't always work though. Most of the time, but not always. There are some exceptions, like la moto, meaning the bike, which is feminine, and il problema, meaning the problem, which is actually masculine. To make things even more complicated, there is a third class of nouns ending with E in the singular and I in the plural. These can be masculine or feminine depending on the word. That's why it's important to learn nouns and their respective genders together with the right definite articles. The definite articles are different from each gender, so they'll help you remember. For example, take bicchiere, meaning glass which is in that third category of nouns ending in E. The right article for bicchiere is il, so il bicchiere is masculine. How about nave, meaning ship? The right article for this one is la, so la nave is feminine. Again, there is unfortunately no formula to find the right gender. The Latin origins of words go way back and often people don't know why some words have a certain gender today. Your best guide is going to be our first rule, singular O and plural I for masculine and singular A, plural E for feminine. Just try to memorize the articles with the nouns and before you know it, the gender classifications will come naturally to you. Woo! That's it for this lesson. Please send in any more questions you have and I'll try to answer them. A presto, see you soon! Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, how do you form the plural of nouns? 
In Italian, just like in English, nouns can be singular or plural depending on what they refer to. To form the plural of Italian nouns, you generally have to change the final letter of the singular form from one vowel to another. Masculine nouns ending in O and A form the plural by changing the final vowel to I. For example, ragazzo, meaning boy, becomes ragazzi in the plural, and the plural of poeta, which means poet, is poeti. Feminine nouns ending in A form the plural by changing the A to E. So, mela, meaning apple, changes to mele when it means apples. Finally, there are also nouns ending in E. Both masculine and feminine nouns that end in E form the plural by changing the final vowel to I. Let's take cane, for example, which means dog, and is masculine. The plural form is cani. Similarity, the plural of chiave, a feminine noun meaning key, is chiavi. However, not all nouns follow these rules. In fact, there are lots of exceptions. Let's see a few of them. Some nouns don't change in the plural. You can still tell if a noun is plural because the definite article or its adjective will be in the plural form, but the noun itself doesn't change. Among the words that remain unchanged in plural, there are all nouns ending in accent vowels, like caffè, meaning coffee, or città, meaning city. Foreign nouns ending in a consonant, for example, computer, film, or sport. Singular nouns that end in I, crisi, meaning crisis, or brindisi, meaning toast. Monosyllable nouns, for example, re, which means king. Some nouns have an irregular plural form. For example, man in Italian is uomo, while men is uomini. And there are even Italian nouns that change gender when they become plural. For example, finger is masculine in the singular form, il dito, but becomes feminine in the plural, le dita. Plurals sometimes can be a challenge even for native Italian speakers. However, exceptions are exceptions. You shouldn't obsess over them. Just memorize the few rules I told you in the beginning and go from there. Pretty interesting, right? If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below. A presto! See you soon! Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is how are verbs conjugated? English verbs are not heavily inflected. In fact, there are just three endings you can add to the infinitive of regular verbs. S for the third person, singular present tense, for example, plays. ING for the gerund, playing. And ID for the past tense, played. Most combinations of tense aspect, mood, and voice can be expressed using auxiliary and modal verbs. Italian, on the other hand, is a heavily inflected language. Italian verbs have lots of different endings depending on their subject, tense and mood. The infinitive is the unconjugated form of the verb, the one you'll find in the dictionary. Italian verbs are divided into three main conjugation groups according to their infinitive endings. Verbs of the first conjugation end in are, for example, parlare, meaning to speak. Verbs of the second conjugation in ere, for example, leggere, meaning to read. Verbs of the third conjugation end in ire, for example, dormire meaning to sleep. Each group has a different and regular conjugation pattern. Even if there are a lot of irregular verbs, most Italian verbs follow one of these three systems of conjugation. 
Each conjugation pattern has different endings you'll need to add to the verb stem. To get the stem of a verb, all you have to do is take away are, ere or ire. So the stem of parlare is parl, the stem of leggere is legge, and the stem of dormire is dorm. Verb endings are affected by mood, tense, person, number and sometimes even gender. Let's take a look. Italian verbs have four finite moods. They are the indicative to express facts, for example, io dormo, I sleep. The imperative to give orders, for example, dormi, sleep. The subjunctive to express doubt, hope, fear and possibility, for example, che io beva, I drink. The conditional to express an action that depends on another fact that may or may not happen. For example, io leggerei, I would read. There are also three non-finite moods, which usually have just one form. The infinitive, which is also the dictionary form. For example, parlare, to speak. The gerund for progressive tenses, for example, leggendo, reading. The participle, generally used as adjective or with the other verbs, for example, parlato, spoken. While mood shows the manner in which an action is expressed, the tense is what specifies when the action happens. The only Italian mood that has all eight tenses in the indicative, which is also the most used mood. The only present tense is the present, io parlo, I speak. Past tenses include present perfect, io ho parlato, I have spoken, imperfect, io parlavo, I spoke, past perfect, io avevo parlato, I had spoken, absolute past, io parlai, I spoke, pre-trade perfect, io ebbi parlato, I had spoken. Future tenses are the future, io parlerò, I will speak. The future perfect, io avrò parlato, I will have spoken. The other moods only have a couple of tenses, usually present and past, except for the subjunctive, which has a few more. This looks like a lot, and it actually is one of the most challenging things even for native speakers. But don't panic, if you get started with the regular verbs in the indicative present tense, you will soon familiarize yourself with the conjugation patterns. Pretty interesting, right? If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below. A presto! See you soon! Hi everybody! Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, when should I use formal Italian? First, Let's see what formal Italian is and how it works. During formal situations in English, you may prefer certain words over others, or you may avoid certain constructions, but you don't need to change pronouns or verb patterns. Italian, however, has two different language registers, a formal or polite one, and informal or casual one. When addressing someone formally, you have to use a different pronoun and a different verb conjugation. The most important thing to remember is that the English second person singular you is translated as to in informal situations. In formal situations, it's translated as lei. Lei is also the third person singular feminine or she, but in formal speech, it's used to address people of both sexes. So, if you are formally addressing a man using lei, make sure that the related verbs or adjectives are in the masculine form. Let's see an example. If you want to ask, how are you, in Italian, you have two options. Tu, come stai, is informal speech, and lei, come sta, is formal speech. Subject pronouns can often be omitted because the verb endings reveal the subject, so it's vital to conjugate the verbs accordingly. Here's another example. Mario, sei andato in vacanza? Which means, Mario, 
Did you go on vacation? This is casual Italian. Mario è andato in vacanza also means Mario, did you go on vacation? But it's polite. You may want to use the first one with a friend of yours and the second one with someone much older than you. Now, back to the original question. When will you need to use informal Italian? Usually Italians tend to be friendly and informal, so they often avoid using formal speech, especially among young people. However, polite Italian is better when you meet someone for the first time or when speaking to older people or to someone in a higher business position than you. In the past, it was common to use voi, which is the second person plural pronoun, as a formal way of addressing someone. Nowadays, lei is the standard formal pronoun, but you may happen to hear also voi in some parts of southern Italy. Pretty interesting, right? If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below. A presto! See you soon! Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, what's the difference between sono and sto? If you study Italian, you may often come across sentences such as sto bene, grazie, meaning I'm fine, thanks, or sono italiana, which means I'm Italian. Sono is a conjugated form of the verb essere. Sto is a conjugated form of the verb stare. Now, both Italian verbs essere and stare can be translated as to be in English, but they are used differently. Essere is the direct equivalent of to be. Generally, it expresses a condition. You can use it for lots of different things like identity, as in sono Paola, I'm Paola, profession, as in sono un insegnante, I'm a teacher, nationality, as in sono italiana, I'm Italian, physical aspects, as in sono alta, I'm tall, emotions, as in sono felice, I'm happy. On the other hand, the meaning of the verb stare depends on the context we use it in. Let's see some of the most common ones. To be, as in sto bene, I'm well. To stay, as in oggi sto a casa, I'll stay home today. To fit, as in la maglietta non mi sta, the t-shirt doesn't fit me. To stand, stare in piedi, to lie, stare sdraiato. Also, a lot of idiomatic expressions use stare instead of essere. For example, stai zitto, be quiet, stai fermo, be still, stai attento, be careful. Stare is also used with the gerund verb forms in progressive tenses. For example, sto studiando italiano means I'm studying Italian or stavano correndo meaning they were running. To sum it up, we could say that stare refers to something that happens, while essere refers to something that is. Here is another tip. Keep in mind that sto is commonly used with adverbs, as in sto bene, I am doing well. Sono isn't. Sono can be used only with adjectives, and in sono italiana, I am Italian. Pretty interesting, right? If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below. A presto! See you soon! Hi everybody! Marika here! Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I will answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is Essere o avere? How can I choose the right auxiliary verb in compound verbs? In Italian, when forming compound tenses, such as the present perfect or passato prossimo, you'll need an auxiliary verb. This will either be essere, to be, or avere, to have. In English, you don't have to make this choice, as you only need to have. That's why deciding which auxiliary to use in Italian can be a bit difficult at first. Let's have a look at some rules that will help you choose the right auxiliary. The first thing you need to remember is that transitive verbs always need avere. Let's see some examples. Io ho mangiato una mela. 
I have eaten an apple. Mangiare, to eat, is a transitive verb, meaning that it can have a direct object. Giorgio ha guardato un film. Giorgio has watched a movie. Guardare, to watch, is also transitive. Abbiamo conosciuto Laura. We have met Laura. Conoscere, to meet, is also transitive. Reflexive verbs, on the other hand, always use essere. Let's see an example. Mi sono innamorato. I have fallen in love. Innamorarsi, to fall in love, is reflexive. Verbs in the passive form also use essere. La mela è stata mangiata. The apple has been eaten. È stata mangiata, meaning has been eaten, is a passive form of mangiare, to eat. What about intransitive verbs? Some use essere and others avere. Although there are no set rules, here are some things you can look out for. For example, intransitive verbs of movement always use essere, such as andare, to go, and arrivare, to arrive. Here are two sample sentences. Ieri sono andata a Venezia. Yesterday I went to Venice. Siete arrivati tardi. You have arrived late. On the other hand, intransitive verbs of movement, where the destination doesn't need to be mentioned, always use avere. Some examples are camminare, to walk, or viaggiare, to travel. A few sample sentences. Abbiamo camminato tanto. We have walked a lot. Ho viaggiato in treno. I've traveled by train. One last thing. There are some cases where both essere and avere are acceptable. This mainly happens with verbs about the weather. Piovere, to rain, nevicare, to snow, grandinare, to hail, tuonare, to thunder. So you can say è piovuto, but also ha piovuto. Both means it has rained. Pretty interesting, right? If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below. A presto, see you soon. Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I will answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, what's the difference between in and a? In and a are two Italian prepositions. While each preposition has its own function, sometimes it's not easy to tell which one to use. In fact, both in and a can indicate place, but when should I use one instead of the other? The first point you should remember is that a is used before the name of a city, town or small island. In, on the other hand, is used in front of continents, states, nations, regions and larger islands. So you'd say a Roma, a New York, a Cipro. But you would say in Italia, in Europa, in Sicilia. We use in before the name of a street or square. Abito in Via del Corso. I live in Via del Corso. Incontriamoci in Piazza del Plebiscito. Let's meet in Plebiscito Square. We also use in with the names of shops. L'ho comprato in farmacia. I bought it at the drugstore. Sono in pasticceria. I am at the cake shop. Sto andando in edicola. I'm going to the newsstand. Besides these tips, like many other Italian grammar points, there are no fixed rules, but there is a list of expressions using in or a, so you can start getting used to them. Sono a scuola, a casa, a letto, a teatro, al cinema, al mare. I am at school, at home, in bed, at the theater, at the cinema, at the seaside. Sono in banca, in chiesa, in classe, in montagna, in città, in ufficio, in biblioteca. I am at the bank, at the church, in the class, in the mountains, in the city, in the office, at the library. Pretty interesting, right? If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below. A presto! See you soon! Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, what's the difference between da and di? Da and di are two Italian prepositions. 
They have multiple functions and meanings and sometimes it's not easy to choose the right one. For example, both da and di can be translated as from, but they are not interchangeable. Let's see the difference. Di specifies a feature or origin of something, usually with the verb essere, to be. Da indicates the movement from somewhere. So you can say, di dove sei? Where are you from? Sono di Roma. I'm from Rome. But, da dove vieni? Where do you come from? Vengo da Roma. I come from Rome. This is because the verb venire, to come, is a verb of movement. Da is also used to indicate movement toward a place or a person. For example, sono stato dal dottore. I've been to the doctors. Sto andando da Paolo. I'm going to Paolo's house. Da also has the meaning of at or to, as in these examples. Da Mario non c'è la televisione. At Mario's place there is no television. Sandra è dal parrucchiere. Sandra is at the hairdressers. Many restaurant names also use this pattern. For example, da Michele, Michele's. Pretty interesting, right? If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below. A presto, see you soon. Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, when do I need to add the terminative articles to possessives? In English, you don't use the article de before a possessive adjective or pronoun. However, in Italian, the definite article is part of the possessive. It isn't optional. Also, remember that possessives must agree in number and gender with the nouns of the own thing, not with the noun indicating the owner. So we say, il mio cane, my dog. Mio is singular masculine because cane is singular masculine. La tua casa, your house. Tua is singular feminine because casa is singular feminine. I suoi genitori, his, her parents. Suoi is plural masculine because genitori is plural masculine and so on. However, there are times when we drop the determinative articles in front of possessive adjectives. One time is before nouns or close family members. We say mia madre, my mom, tuo padre, your dad, suo fratello, her brother, sua sorella, his sister, nostra nonna, our grandma, vostra cugina, your cousin. Exception to these are with the third person plural, loro, their, la loro zia, their aunt, with plural nouns, i tuoi fratelli, your brothers, with modified nouns or if they are preceded by an adjective, la mia sorellina, my little sister, il mio caro zio, my dear uncle, il suo cugino italiano, his Italian cousin. Another case when Italian possessives don't need the article is when the possessive is after the noun or in idiomatic expressions. Mamma mia, oh my, mio dio, my god. Lastly, you don't need to add the article if the noun is already introduced by an indefinite adjective or a number. Here are two examples. Puoi invitare quel tuo amico alla festa. You can invite that friend of yours to the party. Loro sono due miei amici. They are two friends of mine. Pretty interesting, right? If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below. A presto, see you soon. Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, can I also make profession names feminine? Italian nouns have a gender. This means some are masculine and some are feminine. Generally, you can change a masculine noun into a feminine one by changing the article and the final vowel. For example, il bambino, meaning the child, is masculine. La bambina is feminine. Since gender in Italian language is such an important grammar category, the answer to the question is yes. Most of the time you can change profession names into feminine. Let's see how to do that. 
profession ending in ayo and yere, change the ending to aya and yera. For example, fornaio, fornaia, baker, cameriere, cameriera, waiter, waitress. Professions ending in tore, change the ending to trice. Attore, attrice, actor, actress. Profession ending in ista, only change the article to specify the gender. Lo stilista, la stilista, the stylist. Il tassista, la tassista, the taxi driver. What about profession traditionally involving men? Society is constantly evolving and the language must keep up with the times. Today, more and more women are becoming lawyers, engineers, doctors, etc. Some of these titles have a regular feminine form in Italian, such as dottoressa, doctor, or direttrice, chief, manager. But what about other titles that were almost never used for women in Italian history, like ministro, minister, or presidente, president? It is la ministro or la ministra, la presidentessa or la presidente. Some professions have the feminine version ending in essa, but this form is often considered ironic or even derogatory. For example, I'd be better to say l'avvocato instead of l'avvocatessa, lawyer, and la vigile instead of la vigilessa, traffic officer. In the same way, la presidentessa is perceived as politically incorrect. So, when you're referring to a woman, use the masculine version with a feminine article instead. La presidente. Besides, nouns ending in ente and ante don't change in the feminine form. For example, cantante, singer. So it's only natural that it should be la presidente. There are instances where the suffix essa doesn't have a negative undertone. So it's perfectly okay to say poetessa, poetess, and studentessa, student. As for ministro, the most common feminine version is il ministro, the minister. However, Lately, many people have argued that ignoring the gender of the woman who holds the title is politically incorrect as well. So, you may also hear to read la ministro. But this form is also incorrect. Masculine nouns change to feminine by changing the final O to A. Nobody would say la maestro instead of la maestra, the teacher. So the best way to call a female minister is actually la ministra. Professions that borrow English words only change the article. Il manager, la manager. Il designer, la designer. Il leader, la leader. One final thing. In colloquial Italian, when referring to a woman by her family name, it's common to add the feminine article la, the. For example, La Rossi. Although this is something very common, it's politically incorrect because it highlights the gender of the person you're referring to only when the person is feminine. It's as if in English, when referring to a woman instead of just using her family name, like Smith, you said Smith the woman. Pretty interesting, right? If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below. A presto! See you soon! Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, where should I put the adjective? Usually, descriptive adjectives in Italian are placed after the noun they modify. For example, la mela rossa, the red apple, il tavolo verde, the green table. However, sometimes you can put an adjective before the noun. There isn't a fixed rule for when you can invert the order, but here is a tip. The adjective put after the noun is denotative. The meaning is literal. The adjective put before the noun is connotative. The meaning is suggestive. Let's see some examples. Un calciatore grande can be translated as a big footballer. 
The meaning here is literal. The guy is tall and well set. Un grande calciatore means a great footballer. The meaning here is figurative. We don't know if the guy is short or tall. The important thing is he never misses a goal. Un vecchio amico and un amico vecchio are both translated as an old friend in English, but they are not the same. When vecchio is before the noun, it means long-standing. When it's after the noun, it means advanced in years. Here is another example. Ho visto un nuovo film. Here, nuovo has the same meaning as another. I've seen another movie. Ho visto un film nuovo. Here, nuovo is used in its literal meaning. I've seen a new movie. Sometimes the meaning doesn't change, regardless of where you put the adjective. For example, una bella poesia or una poesia bella both mean a beautiful poem. However, some adjectives always come after the noun. These include adjectives that specify color, shape, nationality, religion, category. Occhi azzurri, blue eyes. Una scatola quadrata, a square box. Un ragazzo americano, an American boy. Adjectives that come from the present participle, they end in ante or ente, or from the past participle, ending in uto, ato, ito. For example, un essere vivente, a living being, un sole abbagliante, a dazzling sun, un libro bruciato, a burned book, un paese voluto, a developed country. Adjectives modified by a suffix ino, etto, uccio, accio, etc. Un bambino piccolino, a tiny child, un colore giallastro, a yellowish color. Finally, here is something that may surprise you. English adjectives occur in a specific order, quantity, quality, size, age, and so on. In Italian, on the other hand, the order doesn't really matter when there is more than one adjective. So, if you want to say a beautiful, tall, young woman, you can say una donna bella, alta e giovane, or una donna giovane, alta e bella, or una donna alta, giovane e bella, and other combinations too. Pretty interesting, right? If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below. A presto, see you soon! Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, how can I correctly conjugate the adjective bello? Bello is a very common Italian adjective that means beautiful or good. Despite being common, it's irregular and doesn't follow the regular forms of adjectives. It follows the article rules instead. Let's see all the forms it can take. Just like the masculine article lo, it's bello before a masculine noun starting with z, x, p, s, p, n, g, n, y, s plus consonant. For example, bello zaino, beautiful backpack, bello spettacolo, good show. The adjective becomes bel with an apostrophe before a masculine noun starting with a vowel. For example, belluomo, beautiful man. S G is a plural form for lo and l apostrophe, with an apostrophe similar belli is the plural form of bello and bel. Belli zaini. Beautiful backpacks, belli uomini, beautiful men. It's well before all other masculine nouns, which would take the masculine article il. For example, bel gatto, beautiful cat. Just like i is the plural form of il, similarity bei is the plural form of bel, bei gatti, beautiful cats. It's bella before all feminine nouns, which would take the feminine article la. For example, bella donna, beautiful woman, bella isola, beautiful island. An exception is bella amica, meaning good friend, in an ironic way. Just like le is the plural form of la, belle is the plural feminine form. Belle donne, beautiful woman, belle isole, beautiful islands. 
The demonstrative adjective quello, that, follows the same rules as bello, and it rhymes. Pretty interesting, right? If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below. A presto! See you soon! Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, how do reflexive verbs work? Reflexive verbs are one of those elements that don't really have an English counterpart. A verb in Italian is reflexive when the subject carries out the action on itself. Please note that not all verbs can be reflexive. The infinitive form of a reflexive verb is made by dropping the infinitive ending e from are, ere and ire and adding the pronoun si. For example, svegliare svegliarsi, to wake up. Reflexive verbs, when conjugated, are preceded by a reflexive pronoun that complies with the subject. Let's see an example. Vestire, to dress. P.S. Vestirsi, reflexive form, to get dressed. Maria veste il manichino. P.S. Maria si veste. In the first example, the object of the verb vestire is the mannequin while in the second sentence the object is Maria herself, subject and object coincide. The reflexive pronoun si is conjugated as follows. Io mi vesto, I get dressed. Tu ti vesti, you get dressed. Lei si veste, she gets dressed. Noi ci vestiamo, we get dressed. Voi vi vestite, you get dressed. Loro si vestono, they get dressed. In compound tenses, reflexive verbs have essere to be as auxiliary verb, so we always form the passato prossimo of the reflexive verbs with essere. Let's see some examples. Maria si è vestita. Maria has got dressed. Ci siamo svegliati. We have woken up. We can also use reflexive verbs as reciprocal verbs. The subject is always plural. The reciprocity of the action that the verb expresses often translates in English as each other, for example, noi ci amiamo, we love each other, loro si salutano, they say hello to each other. It's easier than you thought, right? If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below. A presto, see you soon! Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, how can I use the pronoun ne? Ne is an Italian pronoun that takes the place of nouns so that we don't have to repeat the same words. These nouns can refer to people, places or things. Let's take a look at how it can be used. First, ne can be used when replacing a noun introduced by di or any combination like del, della and so on. In this case, it has a partitive meaning. It can be translated as any, some, of it, of them. For example, Hai bisogno di soldi? Sì, ne ho bisogno. Do you need some money? Yes, I need some. Abbiamo del burro? No, non ne abbiamo. Do we have any butter? No, we don't have any of it. Ne can also replace nouns introduced by a number or an expression of quantity. Let's see some examples. Quante borse hai? Ne ho solo tre. How many purses do you have? I have only three. Vuoi dello zucchero nel caffè? Sì, ne vorrei due cucchiaini. Would you like some sugar in your coffee? Yes, I'd like two spoons. We also use ne to replace nouns phrases introduced by the preposition di with specific verbs. Here are some examples. Parlare di, meaning to talk about. Let's see a sample sentence. You can say, domani parleremo del problema, meaning tomorrow we'll talk about the problem. If it's clear what you are going to talk about, you can use ne and say, domani ne parleremo. This means, we'll talk about it tomorrow. In this case, ne replaces the phrase del problema. Another similar case is accorgersi di, meaning to notice. 
You can either say, non mi sono accorto di questo errore. I didn't notice this mistake. Or, if it's clear what you're talking about, you can say, non me ne sono accorto. I didn't notice it. Now, let's see where to put this little word in a sentence. Usually, we position ne before the conjugated verb. For example, ne vuoi ancora? Would you like more? In negative statements, it's always between the negation non and the verb. Vuoi un altro bicchiere di spumante? No, non ne voglio. Do you want another glass of sparkling wine? No, I don't want. In addition, we can attach it to an infinitive or a gerund. Non voglio più berne, grazie. I don't want to drink anymore, thank you. Here we've put together the infinitive bere and ne, making berne. Here is an example with a gerund. Avendone bevuto troppo, ora non si sente bene. Having drunk too much, now he doesn't feel well. There are several rules, so at first try memorizing and actually using a few expressions with ne. You'll eventually get the hang of it. Start with these three. Che ne pensi? What do you think about it? Non ce n'è più. There is no more of it. Ne vuoi? Do you want some? They are pretty simple, right? If you have any more questions, please leave us a comment below. A presto. See you soon. Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, how can I use the particle ci? The Italian word ci can have different roles and thus different meanings. It can be a personal pronoun for the first person plural. In this case, it means us. Here are some examples. Paolo ci ha invitato alla festa. Paolo invited us to the party. La nonna ci leggeva dei libri. Grandma used to read us books. You have to use ci with reflexive and reciprocal verbs when referring to the first person plural, we. Let's consider the reflexive verb svegliarsi, to wake up. We wake up at six. In Italian, that's ci svegliamo alle sei. Here is another example with iscriversi, which means to enroll. We enrolled at the university. An example of ci used with a reciprocal verb is the well-known expression ci vediamo. This stands for see you soon, but literally means we'll see each other. Ci can also be an adverb of place, meaning there. Let's see a couple of examples. Someone asks you, Quando vai in biblioteca? When do you go to the library? You could answer, Ci vado tutti i giorni. This means, I go there every day. Another example, Ci sono molte regole in italiano. There are a lot of rules in Italian. Lastly, sometimes ci takes the place of noun phrases introduced by the preposition a, especially with certain verbs. Let's see a few examples. First, let's consider pensare a, which means to think about. You may hear non ci pensare, meaning don't think about it. Here, ci may stay for quel problema, about that problem. Next is credere a, to believe in. You may hear ci credo, this means I believe in that. Here, ci may stand for addio, in God, or alla notizia, meaning in the news. Last, let's see giocare a, to play at. Ci hai mai giocato? Means, have you ever played at it? Here, ci may stand for a questo gioco, at this game. It's not as difficult as you thought, right? If you have any more questions, please leave us a comment. Ci vediamo, see you soon. Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, what is gerundio? 
Gerundio, or in English, gerund, is a verb non-finite mood. This means that you don't need to conjugate it. It's very similar to the continuous form of English verbs ending in ing. As we said, it's very convenient as you don't need to conjugate it. It only has two endings. Ando for verbs ending in are and endo for verbs ending in ere and ire. Another reason why it's easy is that it only has two tenses, present and past. Here are some verbs in the present gerund. Parlando, talking, from parlare to talk. Cadendo, falling, from cadere to fall. Dormendo, sleeping, from dormire to sleep. To form the past gerund, use the right auxiliary essere, to be, or avere, to have, in the present gerund, plus the past participle of the main verb. Here is the past gerund of the same verbs. Avendo parlato, having talked. Essendo caduto, having fallen. Avendo dormito, having slept. You can use the gerund alone for two actions happening at the same time. Studio, ascoltando la musica. I study, listening to music. To say why something happens. Essendo stanca, Andrò a letto. Being tired, she went to bed. To express a possibility, a hypothesis. Volendo, potremmo andare al cinema. If he wanted to, we could go to the movies. Another way you can use the gerund is combined with the verb stare. To stay, to be. If you combine the present tense of stare and the gerund, you get the present continuous. For example, sto studiando italiano. I am studying Italian. Tu stai leggendo. You are reading. If you combine the imperfect tense of stare and the gerund, you get the past continuous. Stavo studiando italiano. I was studying Italian. Tu stavi leggendo. You were reading. Pretty easy, right? If you have any more questions, please leave us a comment. A presto! See you soon! Hi everybody! Marika here! Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is When should I use the subjunctive or congiuntivo? The subjunctive is a verb mood used to express doubt, hope, fear or possibility. In other words, the subjunctive expresses subjectivity. Basically, you need it to express anything that isn't a sure fact. So, where should you use the subjunctive? In subordinate clauses introduced by a verb expressing doubt, a supposition or a guess. Look at the difference between these two sentences. So che sei stato tu, indicative, versus penso che sia stato tu, subjunctive. I know it was you, versus I think it was you. I know holds the same meaning as I'm sure, I know for a fact. Therefore, you don't need the subjunctive. In the second sentence, penso, I think, means I believe, but I'm not 100% sure. Therefore, it requires the subjunctive. Let's go ahead. You also need the subjunctive in subordinate clauses introduced by a thinking verb. This may express desire, hope, will, but never effect. Here is an example. Spero che tu possa venire alla festa. I hope you can come to the party. Another case is when you're talking about other people's feelings and thoughts. Again, these are things that you can never be sure 100%. For example, Sono contenta che ti piaccia il mio libro. I'm happy that you like my book. You need to use the subjunctive after certain conjugations. Sebbene, although, benché, although, affinché, so that, dovunque, wherever, nonostante, despite, prima che, before. For example, sebbene fosse tardi, la chiamai. Although it was late, I called her. Diglielo, prima che sia troppo tardi. Tell him, 
before it's too late. You should use the subjunctive after impersonal expressions such as Bisogna che it's necessary that È necessario che it's necessary that È possibile che it's possible that È probabile che it's probable that For example È probabile che piova domani It's probable that it will rain tomorrow To form the polite imperative Italian imperative doesn't have all the persons, so the third person borrows its form from the present subjunctive. Prego, si sieda. Please, have a seat. Finally, you need a subjunctive in the if clauses of the second and third conditional. You'll study this later. For now, here is an example. Se lo sapessi, te lo direi. If I knew, I'd tell you. Colloquial Italian often replaces the subjunctive with the indicative. It's not unusual to hear prima che te ne vai, before you leave, instead of prima che tu te ne vada. Or you might hear sono contenta che ti piace, I'm happy you like it, instead of sono contenta che ti piaccia. This is actually a very controversial topic. Some people don't accept these examples as correct Italian. The language is a living thing, so who knows how it'll change in the future. Pretty interesting, right? If you have any more questions, please leave us a comment. A presto, see you soon. Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, why don't I always need to conjugate the verb in a subordinate clause? Sometimes Italian seems simpler than English because it can have an infinitive verb, whereas English has a conjugated form. For example, lui sa di avere ragione. He knows he is right. Why is avere not conjugated? What are the rules that regulate this? The sentence in the example above can be divided into two clauses. Lui sa di, meaning he knows that, is the main clause. Avere ragione, literally, to be right, is the subordinate clause. In English, it's translated as he is right. This is a special kind of subordinate clause called implicit. Implicit subordinate clauses future a non-finite mood verb, which means not conjugable verb. Infinitive is the most used in Italian. If the subject of the main clause and the subordinate is the same, the infinitive can replace clauses beginning with che. Sounds complicated. Look at these examples. Non sono sicura che partirò. I'm not sure I will leave. You can say, non sono sicura di partire. Mario sa che è bravo in matematica. Mario knows he's good at math. You can say, Mario sa di essere bravo in matematica. When the subject in the two sentences is the same and the first verb is a thinking verb, your only option is to use the infinitive in the second sentence. So if you want to say, I hope I will leave, you have to say, spero di partire, not, spero che io parta. The second one is too wordy and sounds unnatural. However, if the subjects are different, you must use the subjunctive. Spero che Laura parta. I hope Laura will leave. Pretty simple, right? If you have any more questions, please leave us a comment. A presto, see you soon. Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, what are modified nouns? In Italian, you can modify nouns. That allows you to convey feelings such as love, hate or irony in a concise and effective way. Modified nouns called nomi alterati can take different endings that convey different feelings. They are usually divided into categories. Let's see which ones. To describe something positively or negatively, you can use pezzeggiativi and dispregiativi. Pezzeggiativi express endearment. Some common suffixes are uccio and ino. For example, tesoruccio, sweetheart, 
gattino, kitten. Dispregiativi express dislike. Common suffix are accio and astro. For example, scarpaccia, ugly shoe, giovinastro, loud. To describe the aspect of something, you can use accrescitivi and diminutivi. Accrescitivi indicate a big size. The most common suffix is one. For example, ragazzone, big boy, nasone, big nose. Diminutivi indicate smallness. Common suffixes are ino, etto, otto, ello. For example, topino, little mouse, bacetto, small kiss, leprotto, small hair, alberello, little tree. Be aware of fake modified nouns or falsi alterati. These are words that look like modified nouns but mean a total different thing. Matto means crazy person, but mattone is not a big crazy man, it's a brick. And mulino means mill, not a small mule, that's mulo. Italian children often learn funny nursery rhymes in school about these false modified nouns. Here is one I just invented, ready? Take note. La gomma per cancellare, il gommone per andare al mare. Col burro puoi cucinare, ma del burrone non scivolare. Se vedi un lampo, c'è il temporale. Se vedi un lampone, lo puoi mangiare. Which means the eraser to erase, the raft to go out to the sea. With butter you can cook, but don't sleep on the ravine. If you see lightning, that's a storm. If you see a raspberry, you can eat it. Pretty fun, right? Do you know any other false modifying noun? Let us know in the comments. A presto! See you soon! Hi everybody! Marika here! Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is What are the top 10 most common Italian idioms? It might not be necessary to know idioms in order to communicate in Italian, but they are very effective and fun. Also, if you can use some idioms, you'll sound more fluent. Are you ready to find out 10 of the most common Italian idioms? Let's start. In bocca al lupo. This literally means into the mouth of the wolf. The origin of this expression isn't clear, but Italians use it very, very often to wish someone good luck. If someone says in bocca al lupo to you, you should reply crepi Il lupo. May the wolf croak. Costare un occhio dalla testa. Literally, to cost an eye of the head. This has basically the same meaning as the English idiom. To cost an arm and a leg. It means that something costs so much that you'd have to sell a part of your body to be able to afford it. Essere al verde. The literal translation is to be at the green but it actually means to be broke. This expression is said to have originated in Florence, where the bottom half of auctioneer candles were painted green. When the candle reached the green, the flow of money would come to a stop. Another theory is that the color refers to the inside of a wallet, which you could see once you were out of money. Tra il dire e il fare c'è di mezzo il mare, Idiomatic expressions about the sea are quite common in Italian. This one means between saying and doing there is a sea in the middle. It means easier said than done. Italians often shorten this expression and just say tra il dire e il fare. Una volta ogni morte di papa. Once every time a pope dies. The English equivalent of this expression is once in a blue moon. Both are used about something happening very rarely. Essere al settimo cielo. This idiom has the perfect analog in English. To be in seventh heaven, meaning to be extremely happy. This expression comes from the philosophy on which Dante's comedy is based. According to this philosophy, the earth is in the center of the universe, surrounded by seven concentric heavens. Seventh heaven was the highest degree of elevation for men. Dormire come un sasso, to sleep like a stone. 
this idiom is basically the same as English. To sleep like a log. It means that someone is sleeping so soundly that they look like an inanimate object. You can also say dormire come un giro, to sleep like a dormouse. Acqua in bocca. The literal translation is water in your mouth. If someone says acqua in bocca to you, they want you to keep it a secret. Because of course, you can't say anything if your mouth is full of water. Il gioco non vale la candela. The game isn't worth the candle. This expression is of medieval origin. Back then, people used candles at night, and candles could be expensive. Card players used to repay the owner of the house that hosted them with either money or a candle. The saying started to spread among players to indicate games where the winnings were so low that they wouldn't even cover the small expense left for the candle. Tagliare la corda, to cut the rope. This expression means to run away from a situation. It originates from the rope that was used to keep boats tied to the shore. To sail, it was necessary to free the boat first, but if someone was in great hurry, the rope would be cut. Pretty interesting, right? That's all for this lesson and this series. Thank you for listening and we'll see you in another series. A presto! See you soon! Want to speak real Italian from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at italianpod101.com 10 lines you need for introducing yourself. Ho studiato l'italiano per un anno. I've been learning Italian for a year. Ho studiato l'italiano per... I've been learning Italian for, and then you add the time you've been learning Italian for. For example, you can say, ho studiato l'italiano per un anno. I've been learning Italian for one year. Or, in my case, for English would be, ho studiato l'inglese per otto anni. I've been learning English for eight years. Il mio nome è Desiree. My name is Desiree. Il mio nome è, my name is, in my case, of course, my name is Desiree. Il mio nome è Desiree. You can just add your name. You can also say mi chiamo. It, it means I'm called. So, yeah, I'm, mi chiamo Desiree. I'm called Desiree. Ciao, è un piacere conoscerti. Hello, it's nice to meet you. Ciao, è un piacere conoscerti. Hi, it's nice to meet you. When, for example, you are inside a big group, and you go like one by one introducing yourself. Maybe you don't say every time è un piacere conoscerti, but you just say piacere, pleasure. And it's okay, it's nice. Vengo dall'Italia. I'm from Italy. Vengo da means I'm from. For example, I'm from Italy, vengo dall'Italia. I'm from Dubai, vengo da Dubai. So vengo da you can put the country name or the city place, it's the same. Vivo a Roma. I live in Rome. Vivo a. I live in. Vivo a Torino. I live in Turin. Vivo a Roma. I live in Rome. I live in New York. Vivo a New York. If you want to say the country, just put in. If you want to put the city, it's a. Vivo a Torino. Vivo in Italia. Sono insegnante. I'm a teacher. Sono, and then you say your profession. I'm, when you're talking about your job, for example, sono insegnante, I'm a teacher, or sono un pescatore, I'm a fisher, fisherman. Anyway, sono, that means I am, it's the way to say what you're doing as a job too, so you just say I am, and then your profession. Ho 22 anni. I'm 22 years old. Ho 22 anni. O numero anni. So, I'm number years. I'm 22 years old. Io ho 22 anni. In Italian, we don't say I am, but I have. So, io ho means I have. And then you put your number of years. So, io ho 22 anni means I'm 22 years old. But literally is I have. Mi piace ascoltare la musica. I enjoy listening to music. Mi piace... I enjoy, I like, for example, mi piace ascoltare la musica, I like listening to music, 
Mi piace leggere libri. I like reading books. Or mi piace molto mangiare. I enjoy eating a lot. Uno dei miei hobby è la lettura. One of my hobbies is reading. One of my hobby is reading. Uno dei miei hobby è la lettura. But you can also say uno dei miei hobby è leggere. So leggere with the verb or lettura it's a noun. You can put both after one of my hobbies. Uno dei miei hobby è. Sto imparando l'italiano su italianpod101.com. I'm learning Italian at italianpod101.com. Sto imparando l'italiano con Desiree. I'm learning Italian with Desiree. Sto imparando l'italiano da solo. I'm learning Italian by myself. Or sto imparando l'italiano attraverso la televisione. I'm learning Italian through television. I'm learning Italian listening to music. Sto imparando l'italiano ascoltando canzoni. Oh, great. That's a great way to do that. The top 10 ways to say hello. So let's start. Buongiorno. Buongiorno. Good morning. You can also say uh, salve. Salve uh, is a more generic word that you can use with um, at any, really any, uh, any time of the day. Uh, and it's quite generic. So salve is something that is very polite. And at the same time, you can use it all the time during the day. So when you meet someone, let's say you say salve. So uh, the person is going to say to you, Salve or buongiorno. Ciao. Hello. Ciao is, well, I think um, everyone knows the word ciao, you know. Um, ciao is quite informal. So you don't say really ciao to older people or uh, the people that you don't know, that you don't know really. So um, you can use ciao with your friends. Uh, but also, let's say, if you're going to a restaurant or a shop and you want to say to the, uh, to the person which is working, um, grazie, ciao, thanks, goodbye, you know, it works, you know. Because ciao, you can use ciao as a hello when you meet someone, but also as goodbye, you know. So it's another very generic word as salve. Non ci vediamo da tanto tempo. Non ci vediamo da tanto tempo. Long time no see. Non ci vediamo da tanto tempo. Non ci vediamo da tanto tempo. Which in English is long time no see. You can also say da quanto tempo non ci vediamo. So it's a very long time that we haven't seen each other. Come ti sei trovato? Come ti sei trovato? How have you been? Which is also, you can say, um, come è andata? Come è andata? Which is pretty much the same. You can use it, uh, let's say, your friend go, goes to, um, your Italian friend goes to uh, somewhere for vacation and you want to ask him uh, how the trip was and you, you can say, come è andata? Uh, which is, come ti sei trovato? How have you been? It's pretty much the same. Come va oggi? How is your day? Come va oggi? Oggi is today. Che si dice? Che si dice? What's up? Che si dice? Which is like, um, what's up? Che si dice uh, is uh, very informal and is more like, um, it's more like a kind of slang, Italian slang. It's not like proper formal Italian. So um, you, you say come stai, you know. Che si dice is more, uh, you know, um, let's, still if you meet your friend, you know, you have like a very uh, informal way to say things to each other, you know. You don't speak like a uh, high Italian, you know. So uh, che si dice is pretty much used for to say like how are you, how is your life, is the same of uh, come va. And um, come stai? Buon pomeriggio. Good afternoon. Buon pomeriggio. Buon 
Pomeriggio. Good afternoon. Come stai? How are you? Uh, usually Italian people, uh, we, we used to say, um, when we meet like a friend, uh, ciao come stai? Like, um, which means, hello, how are you? You know, but you can also say, ciao, come va? Hello, how are you? Come va? Is the same of come stai? Piacere di conoscerti. Piacere di conoscerti. It's nice to meet you. Piacere di conoscerti. Piacere di conoscerti. Nice to meet you. You can also say, è stato un piacere conoscerti. È stato un piacere conoscerti. When you meet someone like for the first time and you like the person, you know, you say, uh, it has been nice to meet you, you know, uh, which is different than nice to meet you, which is when you actually meet the person for the first time, then you say piacere. You can also say just piacere, you know, when you uh, give your hand to, 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 to the person that you're meeting, you can say just piacere. And the person might uh, answer uh, to you piacere mio, which is my pleasure, you know. Come vanno le cose? Come vanno le cose? How is everything? Come vanno le cose? Come vanno le cose? How is everything? So, come vanno le cose is, uh, uh, it refers to something uh, really general. So, how is your life in general, you know? But it's, it's used quite a lot in Italy, this phrase, come vanno le cose. So, today we learn some of the most common greetings used in Italy. Pronti? Are you ready? Allora, cominciamo! Let's start! The most used informal greeting is Ciao! Ciao! Ciao means hi, hello, and goodbye. That's why we use it when we meet, but also when we leave. We should only use this greeting with relatives or friends. And now, let's talk about some more formal greetings. The one you're used to hear in Italy and at italianpod11.com is buongiorno. Buongiorno. Literally, buongiorno means good day. However, we could also interpret it as good morning or good afternoon. As a rule of thumb, we can use buongiorno only during the daytime from morning until evening. During the evening, we say buonasera. Buonasera. So, since sera obviously means evening, buonasera stands for good evening. Buongiorno and buonasera are used when we meet someone, but when we leave, we don't say them again. In this formal situation, Italians use arrivederci. Arrivederci. Arrivederci means goodbye. Finally, in Italian, we use the expression meaning see you soon that can be considered both formal and informal. That is, a presto. A presto. Now, you can greet people in many different ways in Italian. Ciao! Ciao! Buongiorno! Buonasera! Arrivederci! Arrivederci! A presto! A presto! It's easy, isn't it? Now it's time for Consuelo's tips. In formal situations, Italians commonly greet one another by shaking hands. On the other hand, if we meet someone we are very friendly with, we kiss each other on the cheek. Don't be afraid to do it with your Italian friends. It's normal. Ciao! Ciao! In this lesson, you are going to learn how to introduce yourself in Italian. There are only two sentences to do it, but first, it is important to clarify that in Italian there's a difference between formal and informal speech. Let's now see how Italians introduce themselves in an informal situation. 
referring to tu, Italian for you. Ciao, sono Consuelo, piacere di conoscerti. Hi, I'm Consuelo, nice to meet you. Ciao, sono Consuelo, piacere di conoscerti. So, you just need to say ciao. Sono, add your name, and then piacere di conoscerti. Ciao, sono Consuelo, piacere di conoscerti. And now, let's see the same sentence during a formal situation, referring to lei, the Italian courtesy form for you. Buongiorno, sono Consuelo Innocenti, piacere di conoscerla. Buongiorno, sono Consuelo Innocenti, piacere di conoscerla. What has changed from the previous introduction? Let's take a look at this. Ciao has been substituted with the formal greeting buongiorno, Italian for good morning. Sono consuelo has not been changed. Sono stands in both cases for I am. However, during a formal self-introduction, we also say our last name. Consuelo innocenti are respectively my first and last names. Finally, the sentence piacere di conoscerla has switched conoscerti into conoscerla, since conoscerla is referred to lei, the Italian formal courtesy form for you. So, the formal way to introduce yourself is buongiorno, sono, here add your full name, and then piacere di conoscerla. Buongiorno. Sono Consuelo Innocenti, piacere di conoscerla. If you use the correct sentence with Italians, they are definitely going to be impressed. So, ciao, sono Consuelo, piacere. This time we are going to learn how to thank people. So, siete pronti? Are you ready? Cominciamo! Let's start! There are several ways to thank someone. Let's start with the easiest. It's just one word. Grazie. Grazie. Grazie means thank you. When saying thank you very much, you just need to add tante or mille, like grazie tante or grazie mille. Grazie tante or grazie mille. Tante means a lot. And mille means a thousand. Thank you a thousand times. During the last lesson, we mentioned both the formal and informal way of speaking Italian. If you want to be more formal when thanking someone, you should say la ringrazio. La ringrazio. That was the formal way to say thank you when referring to lei, the Italian courtesy form for you. Ringraziare is the infinitive form of the verb to give thanks, to be grateful. How to answer? It's easy. There are basically two different ways to do it. The first is prego. Prego means you're welcome. The other way to say you're welcome is the expression non c'è di che. Non c'è di che means there's nothing about it. So, when someone is saying grazie to you, we can simply reply with prego or non c'è di che. Sometimes we can say them both, like prego, non c'è di che. For example, if someone is giving you something, grazie mille. Prego. Now, it's time for Consuelo's tips. Remember, when in doubt, when it is more appropriate to use grazie or la ringrazio, keep it simple is always your safest bet. If you're not sure whether to use the formal or casual version, you can always simply say grazie. So, grazie mille a tutti. Thank you very much, everybody. 
how to respond to how are you question in Italian. So let's start. Come stai? How are you? Come stai? How are you? Let's say you are meeting your Italian friend that you haven't seen since a very long time and you want to surprise him with some nice Italian questions. So you can say, come stai? E tu? And you? And the answer is actually, e tu? And you? Come sei stato ultimamente? How have you been recently? Come sei stato ultimamente? How have you been recently? Sto bene. I'm fine. Sto bene. I'm fine. Non male. I am not bad. Or also, non male. I am not bad. Anch'io sto bene. I'm fine too. Anch'io sto bene. I'm fine too. Mi sento male. I am feeling bad. Mi sento male. I'm feeling bad. So, mi sento male is definitely when you want to say that you're not right at all. Sto bene. I'm okay. Sto bene. I'm okay. Which is the contrary of saying sto male. Say sto bene. Sto alla grande. I am great. Or sto alla grande. I'm great. Grazie per avermelo chiesto. Thank you for asking. Grazie per avermelo chiesto. Thank you for asking. I mean, this is something quite nice to say all the time when someone asks you about how you are, you know, you say, I'm fine, thanks. And you, sto bene, or anch'io sto bene. Grazie per avermelo chiesto, which is like, you know, thank you for asking. And then, of course, if you're not remembering how to say, uh, thank you for asking in Italian, which is like, grazie per avermelo chiesto, you can say just grazie. You just end the thing in a very nice way. First, you'll see an image and hear a question. Next comes a short dialogue. Listen carefully and see if you can answer correctly. We'll show you the answer at the end. Un uomo e una donna stanno parlando. Quanti anni ha l'uomo adesso? Il giorno del tuo compleanno è molto vicino. Sì, è dopo domani. Quanti anni compirai? 60 anni. Auguri, allora festeggiamo. Grazie mille. Quanti anni ha l'uomo adesso? Un uomo e una donna stanno parlando. Quanti anni ha l'uomo adesso? Il giorno del tuo compleanno è molto vicino. Sì, è dopo domani. Quanti anni compirai? 60 anni. Auguri, allora festeggiamo. Grazie mille. First, you'll see an image and hear a question. Next comes a short dialogue. Listen carefully and see if you can answer correctly. We'll show you the answer at the end. Un uomo e una donna stanno parlando. Con chi abita l'uomo? Perché non viene a casa mia una di queste volte? Grazie, ma sono un po' timida. Parlami un po' della tua famiglia prima. Certo, mio padre è un impiegato e il suo hobby è la pesca. Mia madre fa la casalinga ed è brava a cucinare. Hai fratelli o sorelle? Sì, ho una sorella maggiore e un fratello minore. Mia sorella è sposata e vive all'estero. Mio fratello è uno studente delle superiori. Hai una bella famiglia. Mi piacerebbe incontrarla e parlarci. Con chi abita l'uomo? Un uomo e una donna stanno parlando. Con chi abita l'uomo? Perché non viene a casa mia una di queste volte? Grazie, ma sono un po' timida. Parlami un po' della tua famiglia prima. Certo, mio padre è un impiegato e il suo hobby è la pesca. Mia madre fa la casalinga ed è brava a cucinare. Hai fratelli o sorelle? Sì, ho una sorella maggiore e un fratello minore. Mia sorella è sposata e vive all'estero. Mio fratello è uno studente delle superiori. Hai una bella famiglia. Mi piacerebbe incontrarla e parlarci. You are about to order your lunch and you're interested in the lunch menu. What does the lunch menu say?
What does the lunch menu say? The lunch menu says that today's special is spicy chicken with grilled vegetables. Specialità del giorno. Pollo piccante, verdure alla griglia. There's a notice at the bottom of the lunch menu. What does the notice say? What does the notice say? The notice says there is an extra charge for alcoholic beverages. Costo aggiuntivo. Bevande alcoliche. You're finished with your meal and you're looking at the dessert menu. What kinds of drinks can you choose with the cake set? What kinds of drinks can you choose with the cake set? The menu shows that you can choose from coffee or tea. Caffè, te. Want to speak real Italian from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at italianpod101.com. Want to improve reading in your target language? In this guide, you'll discover the top 10 ways to practice reading with our lessons and learning program. Let's begin. Number one, start a lesson and read along with the lesson notes. With every lesson, you get bonus lesson notes. These give you the lesson in writing, the dialogue, the vocabulary, and the grammar explanations. So, as you listen to a lesson, read along with the lesson notes. By listening and reading along, you hear how each word is pronounced and can easily keep up. Number two, read with the dialogue study tool. With the dialogue study tool, you get the line-by-line -line breakdown of a lesson's conversation. You get the text, the translation, the audio, and, if applicable, the romanization, so you can read and listen to each line individually. To practice your reading, reread and review each line until you master it. Then, move on to the next line. You get this feature in every one of our lessons. Number three, read along with the lesson transcript. You also get transcripts with every lesson. These are word-for-word -word scripts of everything that was said in the lesson and are completely free to access. So use these to read along. Number four, download the PDF notes and transcripts. Want to practice reading on your own time? Save the lesson notes and transcripts as PDFs to your device and keep them forever. That way you can open them up and practice reading at any time. You can also print the PDFs out to keep as physical reading material. Number five, practice with extensive reading books. Extensive reading is a learning tactic where you read as many books as possible at a level that's easy for you, and you follow these two rules. One, you skip over words you don't know, and two, you jump to a new book if the current one is boring. The goal is to help you master reading, vocab, and grammar simply by reading a lot without getting stuck on minor words. 
you can find extensive reading books from absolute beginner level to advanced. These are simple one line per page books and all of the translations are on the lesson page. Simply look for the extensive reading pathways in the lesson library. You can also download these books as PDFs and print them out. Number six, take your time and read slowly. Whether you're reading with the notes, books, or the dialogue tool, be sure to take your time. Read the lines slowly on the first try, just like a child would when they start learning to read. This is so you can get acquainted with every word. Number seven, then speed up your reading. Once you've read a line slowly and are familiar with the words, start speeding up. Reread that same line a little bit faster on the second try, and then a little faster on the third try. Doing this will help you read faster. Number eight, take the reading comprehension video lessons. These lessons are specifically designed to test your reading skills. You're presented with a real life scenario, such as reading a sign at the train station, and are tested on the words presented on the screen. Don't worry, you get the answer at the end. And translations are available in the dialogue section. Number nine, get reading assignments from your Premium Plus teacher. You can also get assignments that cover listening, writing, speaking, and even reading from your teacher. These assignments can be tailored to your goals and needs. You get a new one every week or anytime you're ready for a new one. Number 10, get even more lessons in the lesson library. If you want even more reading lessons, then visit our lesson library and under category, choose reading and writing. You get instant access to all of the pathways and lessons that will help you master all areas of the language, including reading. And if you're ready to finally learn language the fast, fun, and easy way, and start speaking from your very first lesson, get our complete learning program. Sign up for your free lifetime account right now. Click the link in the description. And if you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share it with anyone who's trying to learn a new language, and subscribe to our channel. We release new videos every week. See you next time. Bye. Ciao ragazzi. Hi guys. Welcome to the 10 favorite words chosen by fans. That means by you. Amare. Love. I would say, amo la mia famiglia. I love my family. You can also say, I love my boyfriend. Amo il mio ragazzo. O la mia ragazza. Or my girlfriend. Yeah, as in English, you can use love also referring to things. For example, amo la pizza. I love pizza. And yes, people won't think that you are dating a pizza. Bella. Beautiful. Bella. Beautiful, what a beautiful girl, che bella ragazza, what a beautiful day, che bella giornata. But be careful because bella, it's an adjective and refers to something feminine. Chiacchierare, chat. Chiacchierare means to chat, I love this verb. Chiacchierare in Italian is something that you use when you're talking about not really something important. For example, the weather, what you bought yesterday, what you're gonna do tomorrow. Felice, happy. Felice, happy. I'm really happy to be here. Sono veramente felice di essere qua. Grande, awesome. It's the same as in English. It's an expression that you use to say something you're happy about. For example, if your friend says, Hey, I got a promotion. Hey, mi hanno dato una promozione. Awesome, grande. Innamorato della passione. In love with passion. If I hear someone saying, oh, he is really in love with passion, I would think about someone who does everything with feelings, who puts a lot of efforts in what he does. And so, yeah, it's a great compliment. But in daily life, maybe you would hear more, um, for example, innamorato del lavoro, in love with his job, or doing his job with passion, fa il proprio lavoro con passione. Innamorato della passione refers to an attitude in general, like you're really cheerful, charismatic, and maybe, yeah, just like, just love life. Pay attention that if you're a girl, it would be innamorata della passione, because as I said before, the ending with A refers to a feminine, to a female, and the ending with O to a masculine, to a male. Rispettare, respect. Rispettare le persone, respect people, rispettare le regole, respect rules, or rispettare l'ambiente, respect the environment, 
For example, mm, don't let your water flow when you're brushing your teeth. Salutare, healthy. Salutare, healthy. The word healthy, salutare, comes from salute, that is health. As an adjective, fare jogging tutte le mattine è salutare. Going jogging every morning is healthy. Or mangiare il gelato tutti i giorni non è salutare. Eating ice cream every day is not healthy. Bad health, don't buy ice cream anymore. But if you use it as a verb, it means say hi. Like, ricordati di salutare tua mamma. Remember to say hi to your mother. Also, salute, it's as a noun, it's the word health. But you use it when people sneeze, like it's true. Oh, salute, bless you. Ti amo, I love you. Ti amo, I love you. You say that to someone you really, really care about, you really love, in a romantic way. In Italian, you don't say ti amo to your friends. That would be ti voglio bene. Ti voglio bene, it's like I care about you. I love you as a friend. Can you see that? Yeah. Ti amo, ti amo, I love you. If ti voglio bene is here, ti amo is at the top. So it's something that you would say just to one person. And it can also be your mother, since mother's love, in particular for Italians, as you know, it's supposed to be the first one at the top. Nothing can be more than mother's love, than the love that you have for your mother and the love that mother has for you. Vita, life. Vita, life. Going with the romantic topic that we were having before, you can say, you are my life. Say la mia vita. Vita, what a beautiful life. Che bella vita. Another meaning of the word vita is the waist. Here, basically, above your hips. And yeah, there's no way to distinguish between them. It's vita with the article la vita, la vita, both of case. But yeah, I would say you understand that for the context. We prefer the positive way of thinking. So let's go with life. You're my life. Sei la mia vita. That was the last for our 10 favorite words chosen by fans. Let me know if you have your own favorite word or which one was your favorite. And remember to subscribe. Bye bye. Ciao ciao. Ciao ragazzi. Hi guys. I'm Desiree. And today we're going to learn the 10 hardest words to pronounce. I hope I can manage somehow. Aiuto. Help. Aiuto. Help. This is a really helpful word because you can ask for help. For example, aiuto, sono chiuso dentro al bagno. Help, I'm locked inside the bathroom. You're not dying and you don't need help quickly. You just want to ask if people can help you. That would be aiutare. Puoi aiutarmi, per favore? Can you help me, please? Chiacchierare, chat. Chiacchierare, chat. The most common error mistake would be chiacchierare instead of chiacchierare. Cinque. Five. Cinque. Five. In one hand, there are five fingers. Ci sono cinque dita in una mano. Uno, due, tre, quattro, cinque. Ghiaccio. Ice. Ghiaccio. Ice. Be careful because if you don't pronounce G as a hard sound, like G, it would be giaccio, that it's a verb and means lie down. Vuoi del ghiaccio nel tuo drink? Do you want some ice in your drink? A word that you can hear a lot, especially in summer, is ghiacciolo. It's an ice stick. I eat them a lot. Because it's so hot. And some ice, flavored ice, it's great. Già, already. Già, already. Già has two meanings. First one, already. Sono già le sette. It's, it's seven already. To express consent would be like, Oggi fa proprio caldo. Today is really hot. Già. Yeah. Really. Indeed. Another example would be... Hai già finito? Did you finish already? Lasciare. Leave. Lasciare. Leave. I left my key on the table. Ho lasciato le mie chiavi sul tavolo. Yeah, another meaning would be break up. For example, I don't want to break up with my boyfriend. Non voglio lasciare il mio ragazzo. When I go jogging, I leave my wallet home. Quando vado a correre, 
Quando vado a jogging lascio il portafogli a casa. Quando vado a correre lascio il portafogli a casa. Pesca, peach. Pesca, peach. Yeah, for example, I ate a peach. Ho mangiato una pesca. Il tè alla pesca è il mio preferito. Peach tea is my favorite. Pesca, fishing. Pesca, fishing. Pesca, pesca. You don't open your mouth like pesca, but pesca. And this one is the hobby you can have, for example. I really enjoy going fishing. Mi piace molto andare a pesca. So the difference would be pesca and pesca. Mangio pesce più volentieri che andare a pesca. I enjoy eating fish more than fishing. Segno, sign, mark, stain, signal. Here the difficult is probably the sound ñ that you can practice with gnomo, for example, that it's elf, gnom. Hai lasciato il segno. You really left the mark, you really impressed them, it's something that you would say. Yeah, segno has many meanings in, in English. Un segno sul muro, a stain on the wall, give me a signal, fammi un segno. Be careful not to say segno, but segno, because there is no I. And basically in Italian there is no word with both I and O after ñ. That was the last of our 10 hardest words to pronounce. I hope I was able to give you some advice. If you still have questions or if you still have words that you're not sure about how to pronounce, please write it down and remember to subscribe. Ciao ciao, bye bye. They're making a melody with bells. Yeah, that's Hi guys, I'm Desiree and today we're gonna check together the 10 questions that you should know. Come stai? How are you? In a basic conversation, this would be maybe the first question that people ask you. For example, ciao, come stai? Ciao, bene, tu? Hi, how are you? Fine, thanks, you? Cos'hai detto? What did you say? This is a useful question. You can also add, can you repeat, please? Puoi ripetere, per favore? If you say this in a bad way, like Che cosa hai detto? What did you say? Che cosa hai detto su di me? What did you say about me? It can also be a starting point for a discussion, for an argument. Just go with the plain tone. Cosa hai detto? Puoi ripetere? That's why I advise you to add Puoi ripetere per favore? Can you repeat, please? Di dove sei? Where are you from? I'm from Italy. Sono italiana. This is a question that usually refers to your country, to your nationality. Dov'è il bagno? Where's the bathroom? You can use this question with everything you need to know the place of. For example, dov'è la cucina? Where is the kitchen? Dov'è l'ufficio? Where's the office? Dov'è la scuola? Where's the school? Just put the place that you need to know about after dove è. You can also say, you can also put a street name. Dove è Via della Francia, for example. Dove abiti? Where do you live? This is more specific than di dove sei. For example, when you already know where the person you're talking to comes from, you can add dove abiti. For example, I live in Turin. Io abito a Torino. By the way, if you don't know it, it's a city in the north of Italy. Like here. Dove abiti can also refer to what kind of a house do you have? Like, are you living in an apartment, or a mansion, or a house? Yeah, you can ask this question with dove abiti. Dove lavori? Where do you work? It's another easy question that people would ask you when you're talking about yourself. And you can answer, io lavoro all'aeroporto. I work at the airport, for example. Or I work at the supermarket. Lavoro al supermercato. Che lavoro fai? What kind of work do you do? What is your job? Another question that would come together with dove lavori can be che lavoro fai? What job do you do? What's your job? Qual è il tuo lavoro? Quanti anni hai? How old are you? 
As I said in another video, in Italian you don't answer I am 20, sono 20 anni, but you say I have 20 years old, io ho 20 anni. Dove hai imparato l'italiano? Where did you learn Italian? Ho imparato l'italiano a scuola. I learned Italian at school. I learned Italian by myself. Ho imparato l'italiano da solo. Another question that would come together with dove hai imparato l'italiano or another way of asking this would be come hai imparato l'italiano? How did you learn Italian? And you can answer, for example, I learned Italian listening to songs. Ho imparato l'italiano ascoltando canzoni. If you manage, that's great for you. Bravo! Ti piace la cucina italiana? Do you like Italian food? For example, lasagne, pizza, gelato. I can go on forever, but I will stop here and tell you that another question that will come for, for sure is Qual è il tuo piatto italiano preferito? What is your favorite Italian dish? That was the last of our 10 questions you should know. Please let me know if you have other questions you would like to know about. And remember to subscribe. Bye bye. Ciao ciao. Want to speak real Italian from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at italianpod101.com. Hi guys. Ciao ragazzi. Sono Desiree. I'm Desiree. And today I'm going to tell you 10 phrases to amaze native speakers. Woohoo. Grazie, ma in realtà io non sono un madrelingua. Thank you, but I'm not a native speaker, actually. So it probably means that someone complimented you on your Italian. Like, wow, il tuo italiano è perfetto. Wow, your Italian is perfect. Yeah, thank you, but I'm not a native speaker. Sì, grazie, ma non sono un madrelingua. If people tell you something and you answer in this way, means you have a high level, like high proficiency level of Italian. Good job. Ho capito completamente tutto quello che hai detto. I completely understood everything you said. Actually, maybe it's better to say Ho capito tutto quello che hai detto. I understood everything you say. Because if you add completamente, completely, it's kind of too much. So, yeah, ho capito tutto quello che hai detto. They would be amazed. Like, wow, you're great. But then people will expect that you know everything, like really everything. And maybe you use also different words. I would stay with the stay humble, like, yeah, I got the sense of that. Sì, ho capito il senso di quello che hai detto. So you can always surprise people and not make them expect that you know everything. But that's my personal thing. Ho studiato italiano per dieci anni. I've been learning Italian for ten years. Well, that's amazing when I think that you did that for so long. Ten years is really long. But it's not really something to be proud of if you're still not able to talk a lot. So yeah, be careful with this phrase because you can amaze people because they would like admire you for how much efforts you put in your study. But yeah, if you have a high level or you feel confident in Italian or whatever language you're learning, you can say, hey, I, ho studiato l'italiano or some other languages per dieci anni. And that's amazing. But yeah, just be careful. <laughs> Not to make the other person expect that you know everything. And then you don't. That it's completely understandable. But yeah, people would be amazed because you had so such a long patient, basically. You were patient and studied so long. If you haven't been learning Italian for 10 years, but less, it's, you just say the number and then add anni, like due anni, tre anni, quattro anni, uno, one would be anno and not anni. Or probably something that would amaze even more, it's when you say, ho studiato l'italiano per neanche un anno. I've been learning Italian for not even a year and you know how to speak that, that's amazing. And yeah, people will be amazed. L'italiano è divertente e facile da imparare. Italian is fun and easy to learn. I can believe that it's fun for people to learn that, but I wouldn't say that it's easy. So if you tell a native speaker that you find it easy, I will be impressed because we have so many verbs, so many ir irregular verbs, and we have articles like feminine and masculine. I understand that it's really hard to understand. Like who, who established what's feminine and what's masculine? But that's a secret. So yeah, 
if you find Italian fun and easy, quindi se trovi l'italiano divertente e facile, you amazed me. <laughs> mi ci è voluto solo un anno per diventare fluente. It took me only one year to become fluent. That's amazing, for real. As I was saying before, I know Italian is not easy, but you know that actually, I didn't know that, I just learned that, like I was reading an article and it says that Italian is the fourth most learned language in the world. So we have English, Spanish, Chinese, and then Italian. I was really surprised about that. I don't know why so many people learn Italian, but if you find that fun and easy, you're welcome. Oltre a conoscere l'italiano, so parlare anche alcune altre lingue. Apart from knowing Italian, I can speak a few other languages. Yeah, that's great, but it always depends on, like if you can say, hey, how are you, in 20 languages, that it's amazing. But like to amaze people, you need to have a high level. So in my opinion, at least in my case, I would say that studying two languages at a time, it's already enough. Parlerò italiano come un madrelingua in tre anni. I will speak Italian like a native speaker in three years. But if you're, you're not that confident, maybe don't say that because people will expect you to do that. Maybe people will be like skeptical and be like, oh, really? And how are you going to do that? Tell me, you master, Italian master. If you really know that you can do that, like maybe you are going to study abroad in Italy, staying there, spending there two years, also maybe one if you studied a lot before. I'm sure you will be fluent. So you can say that, but don't use it too much. <laughs> don't be overwhelming. If you want to say something not so strong, maybe you can say Vorrei parlare italiano come un madrelingua in tre anni. I would like to speak Italian like a native speaker in three years. And that's more acceptable. <laughs> People will like it more. So I suggest you vorrei instead of I will, instead of parlerò. Parlerò is I will speak. Vorrei, I would like to. So yeah, anyway, keep it up. Posso guardare film italiani senza sottotitoli. I can watch Italian movies without subtitles. That's amazing for real. How many times did I say amazing in this video? Anyway, well, actually, maybe you can, it can be helpful to do that because you pay more attention on what they do and you're not like, oh, it's okay, anyway, I can read the subtitle. No, you need to focus on what they say. And especially for Italian movies, like, I mean, Italian movies made by Italian actors. Maybe that's also a good way to learn Italian because they use a lot of gestures and you can learn like how to say, I'm hungry, you do these on your stomach and it means I'm hungry, yeah. Or these, can we go? Yeah, so if you watch Italian movies, it's a good way to learn fun things actually and to learn Italian idiomatic expression, expressions maybe, so yeah. That's a good phrase to amaze people, but also a good phrase, a good thing to do to learn, actually, Italian. Posso memorizzare circa 50 nuove parole italiane al giorno. I can memorize around 50 new Italian words a day. That's a lot, like 50. Whoa, <laughs> no, I would never be able to. But if you can, <laughs> do that. And yeah, tell that to people, but that means that like in, One week, you will have 350 new words. Yeah, if you don't manage to memorize so many words in a day, maybe you can change the number and say, for example, posso memorizzare circa 10 nuove parole italiane al giorno. I can memorize around 10 new Italian words a day. And that's cool too. I mean, as long as you can keep it every day, it's great. I would say it's not about how many words you learn, but how many times you do that. Like if you really manage to do that every day, you're basically done. You will manage to be fluent in no time. Keep it down and then if you can make more, that's even great. Better, but still be humble if you manage to. Sto imparando l'italiano tutto da solo. I'm learning Italian all by myself. Wow. <laughs> Again, wow. How do you learn a language by yourself? If you're not attending lessons, you can watch videos online, like you are doing now, <laughs> or read books, grammar books, but also normal books. And watch movies, listen to songs, 
try to speak it with person, like real people, maybe native speaker would be better, that will correct you, or even if they will not, because they're not teachers, but just people you want to talk to, like friends, at least you can see if they really understand what you want to say. And that's a good way to check the improvement you have done. That was it for the 10 phrases to amaze native speakers. I hope you get to the point where you can say one of them proudly soon. And I'm happy if, you can, if I can help you just a little. So com comment if you want to tell me something. And remember to subscribe. Bye bye. See you soon. Ci vediamo. Hi, everybody. Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, what are the top 10 most common Italian idioms? It might not be necessary to know idioms in order to communicate in Italian, but they are very effective and fun. Also, if you can use some idioms, you'll sound more fluent. Are you ready to find out 10 of the most common Italian idioms? Let's start. In bocca al lupo. This literally means into the mouth of the wolf. The origin of this expression isn't clear, but Italians use it very, very often to wish someone good luck. If someone says in bocca al lupo to you, you should reply crepi il lupo. May the wolf croak. Costare un occhio dalla testa. Literally, to cost an eye of the head. This has basically the same meaning as the English idiom, to cost an arm and a leg. It means that something costs so much that you'd have to sell a part of your body to be able to afford it. Essere al verde. The literal translation is to be at the green, but it actually means to be broke. This expression is said to have originated in Florence where the bottom half of auctioneer candles were painted green. When the candle reached the green, the flow of money would come to a stop. Another theory is that the color refers to the inside of a wallet, which you could see once you were out of money. Tra il dire e il fare c'è di mezzo il mare. Idiomatic expressions about the sea are quite common in Italian. This one means between saying and doing, there is a C in the middle. It means easier said than done. Italians often shorten this expression and just say tra il dire e il fare. Una volta ogni morte di papa. Once every time a pope dies. The English equivalent of this expression is once in a blue moon. Both are used about something happening very rarely. Essere al settimo cielo. This idiom has the perfect analogue in English, to be in seventh heaven, meaning to be extremely happy. This expression comes from the philosophy on which Dante's comedy is based. According to this philosophy, the earth is in the center of the universe, surrounded by seven concentric heavens. Seventh heaven was the highest degree of elevation for man. Dormire come un sasso, to sleep like a stone. This idiom is basically the same as English. To sleep like a log. It means that someone is sleeping so soundly that they look like an inanimate object. You can also say dormire come un giro. To sleep like a dormouse. Acqua in bocca. The literal translation is water in your mouth. If someone says acqua in bocca to you, they want you to keep it a secret. Because of course, you can't say anything if your mouth is full of water. Il gioco non vale la candela. The game isn't worth the candle. This expression is of medieval origin. Back then, people used candles at night, and candles could be expensive. Card players used to repay the owner of the house that hosted them with either money or a candle. The saying started to spread among players to indicate games where the winnings were so low that they wouldn't even cover the small expense left for the candle. Tagliare la corda, to cut the rope. This expression means to run away from a situation. It originates from the rope that was used to keep boats tied to the shore. 
to sail, it was necessary to free the boat first, but if someone was in great hurry, the rope would be cut. Pretty interesting, right? That's all for this lesson and this series. Thank you for listening and we'll see you in another series. A presto! See you soon! Want to finally start speaking in your target language? In this guide, you'll discover the top seven ways to practice speaking on your own with our lessons. Let's begin! Number one, shadowing. Shadowing is a proven learning technique where all you do is repeat what you hear in order to practice speaking. So access any audio or video lesson on the site and press the play button to start. Then as you listen or watch, just repeat the conversations. Or even easier, read along out loud with the dialogue section. The script is right there in front of you. With our lessons, you can master entire conversations just like that. Number two, read out loud. I just mentioned it, but reading out loud is another powerful tactic and deserves its own mention. With every lesson, you get written transcripts and translations. So as you play the lesson, read the dialogue out loud as you hear it. Why? By reading out loud, you're also practicing your speaking skills. You can do this with the lesson notes, the lesson transcript, or the dialogue tool. With the dialogue tool, you can listen to each line again and again, and repeat out loud until you master them all. Number three, speed up your reading to speed up your speaking. Being able to speak without thinking is a sign of language mastery. If you're talking to a native and can respond quickly, they'll assume that you're fairly fluent. How can you do this? When you read out loud, try increasing your speed a little bit every time. So start by reading with the dialogue tool. If you're like most learners, you'll read the first line slowly. That's because you're still getting used to the words, which is okay. Reread it. On your second try, you know most of the words and you'll read a little faster. Reread it again. On your third try, you'll be even faster at a native speaker's speed. And being able to read these phrases out loud and fast will help you speak fast. Number four, record and compare yourself with native speakers. In order to sound like a native speaker, you must imitate native speakers. So here's how. Access the voice recorder which is in the dialogue study tool in every lesson. Click on the microphone icon, listen to the native speaker's audio, and then record yourself. You can then compare the two recordings side by side and practice and try again and again until you perfect your pronunciation. Number five, get feedback from our Premium Plus teacher. If you're learning by yourself and don't have access to real teachers, then you can always get feedback from our Premium Plus teachers. With the My Teacher tool, you can record yourself speaking and send the audio file to the teacher. They'll review it and tell you what to improve and how. That's it. Number six, level up your speaking with Premium Plus assignments. With Premium Plus, you can also get assignments that cover reading, writing, listening, and even speaking from your teacher. These assignments can be tailored to your goals and needs. You get a new one every week or anytime you're ready for a new one. Number seven, get even more lessons in the lesson library. If you want even more lessons on speaking and conversations, visit our lesson library and under category, choose conversation. You'll get all of the pathways and lessons that are focused on speaking. If you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share it with anyone who's trying to learn a language, and subscribe to our channel. We release new videos every week. And if you're ready to finally learn language the fast, fun, and easy way, and start speaking from your very first lesson, get our complete learning program. Sign up for your free lifetime account right now. Click the link in the description. I'll see you next time. Bye! Want to speed up your language learning? Take your very first lesson with us. You'll start speaking in minutes and master real conversations. Sign up for your free lifetime account. Just click the link in the description.